हम लोग को थोड़ा उधर भी दिखना चाहिए उधर है
Good evening and welcome to the 10th edition of Creative Theory Colloquium 2023. Since 2014, the Creative Theory Group has been organizing the annual Creative Theory Colloquium, collaborating with India International Center and the Raza Foundation. This event is held on September 5th and 6th each year, coinciding with Teachers' Day in India, and commences with a tribute to the inspirational teachers who have guided the project. The Creative Theory Colloquium is a unique platform for theorists to unite, fostering a vibrant space for generating and analyzing ideas. It offers an open and emergent environment where novel theories can take shape and develop. Today, we are here to celebrate the decade-long journey the Colloquium has undertaken. And without further ado, I would like to invite the convener of Foundation for Creative Social Research, Professor Savita Singh, to officially begin the inaugural event of the colloquium. Wonderful, Sanjana. Today, for the first time, I've actually written out my welcome note because uh, now I forget names. So everything must be in order. This is our 10th Creative Theory Colloquium. We have reached here traveling the path of Indian political theory, which is in our view marked by our critical creative approach to understanding the totality of our theory and practice. I welcome you all with our hearts and minds put together. We have systematically attempted to overcome the analysis of some people who are dismayed by its poverty, that is the poverty of Indian political theory. I welcome you all today on this wonderful occasion of a colloquium, uh, for it would not have been, it would have not happened without the inspiration of Professor Randhir Singh, Professor Manoranjan Mahanti, Roy Bhaskar, and Herbert Matthuser, whom we have we are studying very carefully now. We are inspired by their writings and taking our measured strides. It is also important to note and count our gratitude to IIC, the Raza Foundation, the International Herbert Marcus Society, USA, and most recent addition to our collaborators, Shanti Sahyog, which works with the most marginalized sections of our society. Our four-day colloquium has been organized to debate, reflect, and understand the creative potential of plurality and relationality as the basis of our democratic, social, and political life. We have printed just a few copies of our booklet containing information about our previous colloquium or colloquia, concept notes of each session of the present colloquium, and a few more things. We have a website, and we have a website now. A lot more will be available, including video recordings of our previous discussions there. To welcome you all, we have our friends from Marcuse Society from the USA, Canada, and Brazil. Also, Sri Ashok Vajpayee, a fine poet and thinker writing in Hindi. Also, the, the trustee of Raza Foundation is here. Generally, the director of IIC also joins us on this occasion. This year, he has not been able to make it. He is out of station. To share more on what all we have been able to do apart from the colloquium every year, Dr. Man Dr. Manindranath Thakur is the best person to speak about it. Thank you again for joining us. My particular thanks to the Panelists of the inaugural session, Professor Shyam Menon, Professor Anil Far, Professor Gopal Guru, Professor Rajiv Bhargav will join us a little late, and Professor Roop Manjari Ghosh. Also, uh, very thankful that Professor Lamas, Professor Imakulada Kangusur, Professor Terry Mali have been able to join us through our Zoom link as part of the welcome team as our collab collaborators and also the host of this colloquium. My good wishes to all those who have worked hard to make the colloquium happen, and I hope it goes gloriously well. We are committed to doing political theory uh, in the way creative theory is guiding us. That is to say, one way of doing political theory is to do creatively, and that is why we call it creative theory. Now I want. Uh, Manna Thakur, to talk about what all Creative Theory uh, Group is doing uh, and what our, our range has become now. Thank you very much. 
Welcome you all again. Thank you, Sarita. Uh, well, once again, let me say that I have first time written down what I need to speak. So I also feel a bit, feel a bit nervous about it. Uh, I welcome all warmly on behalf of the Foundation for Creative Social Research and the Association for Creative Theory. We express our heartfelt gratitude to our dedicated partner organizations whose support has been invaluable throughout our decade long journey. Our overarching vision involves around the establishment of an inclusive, interdisciplinary, and intergenerational community committed to engaging in meaningful discussions. We aim to contemplate real life experiences and explore various theoretical perspectives from the unique standpoint of marginalized and unprivileged people. It should be noted that the research groups within this community are constantly moving towards formulating their perspectives on the themes of their concern. Over the past decade, we have made substantial strides in achieving the goals we set for ourselves. Our journey has involved engaging seasoned scholars and emerging talents, fostering a creative approach to transformative social science. You can trace the ethos of our discussions during the CTC in the research and writings of many of them. It's heartening to report that our active members have embarked on journeys to various universities across the globe. The ever-expanding community fills us with unwavering confidence in our project's trajectory. We have initiated a series of dialogues, discussions, and seminars on topics of contemporary significance. Our recent deliberation on the peace process in Manipur has generated considerable attention with peace activists embracing our social healing approach to conflict resolution. Likewise, our perspectives on knowledge systems, religion, consciousness, gender, environment, and many more have been gaining attraction. To conclude our perspective, to consolidate our perspective, we have devised an ambitious publishing agenda. In the themes in Creative Theory series, we have already published two volumes and many more are in the pipeline. I'm pleased to announce that IAC has agreed to publish our occasional paper series Selected to launch by year's end. And the team has been constituted to oversee this endeavor. Allow me to introduce you. <laughs> Allow me to introduce you to two volumes to be launched today. One, Corporate Social Responsibility in India, Law, Regulation, and Politics, authored by Dr. Suchi Bharti, is to be, the be to the best of my knowledge, the pioneer exposition of TSR politics, a subject of significant uh, importance today. The second volume, Sexuality Reimagined, MSM in Modern India, authored by Salia Tandon, is arguably the first of its kind, founded on robust fieldwork. And Books in India has published these books as part of the series with the international edition by Palgrave. Many of our members have started Hindi language publications. As we believe that producing knowledge accessible to common people initiates a creative dialogue. Writing in Indian languages is integral to our mission and Setu publication has been instrumental in advancing this initiative. We have established a dedicated website, meticulously crafted and maintained by our, our very esteemed members of the group. Our YouTube channel is steadily evolving into an engaging platform, thanks to the dedicated team of volunteers who record and upload our content. Reflecting on the past decade, we take pride in our, ex our achievements, yet recognize the many un unrealized dreams that lie ahead. The next decade promises to be equally challenging and rewarding. Our focus now extends to offering online courses and workshops centered around our nurtured themes, 
the publication of all papers presented in our colloquia and seminars as thematic volumes. Uh, lastly, we are progressing towards realization of our long cherished dream, a journal, a journal of creative theory. I extend my heartfelt gratitude to everyone with the hope that our collaboration will persist. I'm delighted that our young generation members firmly uphold the belief that knowledge is a collective project. They undoubtedly form the backbone of the Association for Creative Theory. Thank you very much. I would now like to take this opportunity to invite uh, Professor Savita, Professor at School of Development and Gender at IGNO, Professor Manindranath Thakur, Associate Professor at Center for Political Studies, JNU, Professor Andrew De Lamas, who's joining us from uh, USA here. He's a professor at University of Pennsylvania. Professor Terry Male, Associate Professor at Department of Politics, York University. Professor Imakulada Kangashu, faculty at Univers uh, Universitate Petral de Oro Preto, Brazil. And Professor Ashok Vajpayee, trustee of the Raza Foundation and a phenomenal poet who is widely recognized as an outstanding promoter of culture and an innovative institution builder to launch the two books that are uh, that have been just introduced by Professor Thakur, Sexuality Reimagined MSM in Modern India by Shel Chartandan, and Corporate Social Responsibility in India, Law, Regulation and Politics by Shuchi Bharti. so we are progressing well, I think, in terms of records, maintaining records. I would also like to take the opportunity to officially launch our website of Foundation for Creative Social Research. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be played on the projector as people would expect, but here is a laptop and I hope that, um, so. Can we have a round of applause, please? It's a good, it's a good. Now we would officially begin with the inaugural panel and I would hand over the session to Dr. Ritusha Tiwari. Thank you, Sanjana. And once one again, second, one, second, one second, yes. Yeah. Sanjana, you have to invite Professor Lama, Professor Terry Mali, and Ima Kulada. They are part of the welcome team to speak a little bit. Professor Arnold will be speaking on the as part of the panel of speakers. Okay. My apologies. I would like to invite Professor Lamas. If he could share some few words with us. Good day, everyone. Can you hear me okay? I begin. I'm nobody. Who are you? Are you nobody too? Critical theory and creative theory understand Emily Dickinson's words, the solitude of loneliness and despair, exclusion and alienation, but also the at once reaching for the other, implying a shared vulnerability as the basis for our solidarity. And perhaps even if we make it so, the power to overcome. We are not alone. We are not even best understood as individuals, but rather as social beings in and of nature, 
constituted by the web of social relations through which we produce, reproduce, attempt to know, to understand, and even to make something beautiful of the world with and for one another amidst our precarity. We understand that our trajectory is toward solidarity or extinction. Today, we walk towards one another because we have come to realize that our critical theory and our creative theory cannot be solitary, singular pursuits because separately, we will fail to achieve what we need now, to see what is invisible to conventional eyes, to embrace what is sanctioned as untouchable, to find our dignity in the common struggle for bread and roses. What we know to be true and real is confronted by triumphalism and fetishism. When questions of violence and hunger and unjust accumulation are answered with flights to the moon and speculative finance. When in the encounter with capitalism's stranglehold on humanity's advanced technology, the very worth of the human itself is called into question. At such times, yes, it can feel as though all that is solid is indeed melting into air. But grounded as we are in generations of liberatory tradition and struggle, we know that while this artificial intelligence can produce a straighter line or a quicker buck or a shortcut to information already generated by humans, it cannot create the curved line of Savita Singh's poetry. It cannot create the critical insight of Manindra Thakur. It cannot so generously bestow the wise counsel of Manaranjan Mahanti, nor can it conjure the blues out of a hard day's labor. The capitalist machine knows many things, but it does not know empathy. And it is empathy that is required for great art, for a better world, and even for a good joke. It is not knowing, it is not the knowing, but the how we are becoming on the way to knowing that matters. Now, please permit me to conclude in this way. A critical theorist and a creative theorist walk into a bar, arguing about who's the best at what they do, only to find that the table they had reserved is already occupied by dialectic and contradiction, who are pointing out the window, not to the old stone bridge and not to those gathered there to smoke read philosophical novels, throw dice, and watch the water flow by beneath, but rather they are pointing beyond the bridge, across the river, to an, an abundant land not yet consumed by a raging fire, to a beautiful people not yet defeated. Go there, they say, we will find you there. Thank you. Now I request Professor Terry Mali if he, he would like to share something with us. Uh, hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear okay? Okay, great. Thank you. Well, it's uh, uh, to Savita and your colleagues in the creative theory group, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I'm I'm uh, so glad to be able to uh, participate in the in the uh, the opening session of the colloquium. 
uh, you know, when I read the title uh, uh, of Unveiling the Paradigm Shift and the title of the, the, the remainder of the conference, Pluralism and Relationality, I couldn't help but think that both of these things could not be more necessary today in the environment that we're in. And, uh, you know, when I, uh, 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 in terms of the, the creative theory that your group does, it's a, a, a fantastic uh, uh, development and, and, and discussion that has gone on uh, ever since I've, I've uh, known Savita, who came to the 2019 International Herbert Marcuse Society Conference in Santa Barbara, California. And uh, we've worked together as co-chairs of the International Herbert Marcuse Society since then on a variety of projects. And uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, have, that have had a tremendous uh, synergy and compatibility and affinity with the projects and the thinking that go on within the Herbert Marcuse Society uh, itself. And so uh, I, I think the themes that have been mentioned thus far in the opening remarks about the accessibility of knowledge for common people and knowledge as a collective project are absolutely critical and crucial these days for precisely the reasons that Andrew Lamas has just mentioned uh, as well. And uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I, I'll be very short today, I just wanted to say that I think this is a, a fantastic endeavor that has so many affinities with uh, the, the work of the International Herbert Marcuse Society and all of the colleagues some of whom are here today, who have contributed for many years to the development of uh, uh, critical theory and the, the development together of reason and imagination at the same time. And this is something, of course, Marcuse emphasized at various points in his aesthetic theory and elsewhere and in his own, uh, uh, his own activism and his critique of traditional social science. I think this, uh, the idea of unveiling a, a paradigm shift is fantastic and absolutely critical today. Uh, and the reason and imagination, uh, uh, traditional uh, critique, uh, critique of traditional philosophy, traditional political economy, traditional politics must go together with uh, imaginative, the imaginative development of our collective resources, faculties, etc., in precisely the way that people have uh, already touched on so far in the first few minutes of the uh, opening addresses of the colloquium. Um, I, I was reminded, as, as Savita was talking as well, of uh, Max Horkheimer's theory, uh, famous essay, uh, Traditional and Critical Theory, and the development and evolution of that critical theory uh, continues, of course, today, as, as Andrew Lamas mentioned, it continues within the Marcuse Society, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm so honored and pleased that it continues as well in all these wonderful, brilliant, and beautiful ways in the Creative Theory Colloquium as well. Uh, and so we're, we're, those of us from the Marcuse Society and I am, am, am very pleased to be able to uh, uh, say hello and, and welcome you and participate together on this journey that we are all on as it unfolds and develops uh, in these seminars in our Marcuse Society conferences and historically as well in the activist, the scholar activist work that we do in addition to our philosophical, academic, and other work. So thanks very much. Uh, I, I, I um, uh, look forward to uh, uh, the, uh, the the colloquium, absolutely. It's the beginning of our school week here, so I won't be able to participate in too much of it, but I know that some of our colleagues, it's our first week of classes rather, And uh, uh, but I, I've, I've been to a number of the, the colloquium uh, sessions in the past, and uh, and I invite anyone who, who, uh, who whose work uh, 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 who might want to join us in the International uh, Herbert Marcuse Society uh, and, and talk to us about their work as well. Thanks very much. Now I would like Professor Kangusu to join us as well and please share her work. Yes. Uh, Professor Imakala, announce, announce. Professor Imakala, please, we would like to hear from you as well. Uh, Ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yeah, it's better. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. 
and uh, congratulations to Savita and all the organizers. Well, the first time I hear the name of the Creative Theory Colloquium, uh, Pluralism and Relationality, I, I really think it's very, uh, it's very important today uh, because pluralism is, uh, is essential to describe the structure of the society we live in with all these electronic devices, technical bureaucracy, uh, financial capital, one person cannot understand the structure of the society. This, uh, it's impossible to uh, have the knowledge about everything. So we need each other. We must trust each other, at least the plumber or the mechanic. We must trust each other. So pluralism is uh, something really to discuss. And relationality, um, it's very important also to understand this uh, structure because um, both of the power and the fights against the power deal with it. Um, I remember when I first heard the, the title, I remember a concept uh, not created but named by uh, Patricia Hill Collins she named it intersectionality because uh, intersectionality, you know, came from uh, intersection. That's a, a, a word very used in mathematics and hard science to describe a place that it's common to different uh, systems. And in uh, Patricia Hill Collins use it to describe uh, the same phenomenon in our fights, uh, a common place that belongs or that it experienced, but different fights against capitalism, racism, nationalism, whatever. So I think it's a very, it's a, it's a very uh, important concept, relationality. And Patricia Hill Collins, in the introduction of her book uh, named um, intersectionality, a critical theory uh, published by Duke University Press in 2019. She says in the introduction that relationality is uh, the core concept to understand intersectionality. So I think that uh, all I have to do is to congratulate you for this organization and the team you chose and I'm feeling very honored to be here. Thank you. We're extremely grateful to you, ma'am. And uh, Professor Fau, we will have you uh, in the inaugural pa panel, which we will begin very shortly. Uh, meanwhile, I would like Professor Ashok as well to... Um, I'm always nervous when we attend colloquiums of creative theory. Uh, I am reminded of a chief minister, my hat, and I was wanting some support for Indian classical music. He said, Vajpayee Sahib, I don't understand a wee bit of it, but I think it is important and we should support it. <laughs> so, Right from the beginning, when Savita Ji and Manindra Thakur approached me, I tried to understand what the juice is this creative theory, whatever little I understood. But then I thought there are limits to my knowledge. And at this age, I cannot keep on culling knowledge from all over the sources. So I left it at that, half understood, but very welcome. And therefore, the Raza Foundation has been supported it right from the beginning. And we'll continue to support you as long as you need our support. 
uh, you are moving towards uh, some kind of autonomy already, and perhaps you would not need us, but that's fine. Uh, second thing I want to say is the we I don't continue to need you. <laughs> well, if you do, we are there. Uh, the other thing that occurs to me is that. I don't know enough about the world of ideas, but it seems to me that there is a global crisis in ideas. There are no overarching ideas. There was a time when we could think of overarching ideas. Now there are too many ideas. There's a plurality of ideas, but none of them sort of becomes a presence. We seem to be living in times when we have come to believe, as it, most people come to believe that world can be changed by things rather than by ideas. And that seems to be a crisis. So there is perhaps a replacement or displacement uh, of ideas by things. And we seem to be moving towards a plurality of things rather than plurality of ideas. Now, having said that, I add the third point. In India today, we have a very interesting phenomenon. Internationally, we keep on claiming that we are a very pluralistic society, that we are a very pluralistic democracy. And within India, at least the state of the day is trying to do its best to either sideline or demolish or destroy this plurality. So we are faced with this, I don't know whether this is a creative use. This is also a kind of a very uh, evil creativity, perhaps, an ignoble creativity, where you make public adherence to certain concepts and violate and trample upon them in practice. I see you have the theme with debating theory and practices. So here is a theory which seems very nice and which seems very Indian, uh, etc. Now, if you look at the Indian tradition itself and even Indian modernity, it has always been plural. In fact, I'm very fond of saying in India, nothing is allowed to be singular for long. Everything is becomes plural, whether it is religions or customs or cuisines or um, uh, metaphysics or philosophy or whatever. Everything is plural. Right from the beginning, you have four Vedas rather than one holy book. You have 18 uh, Upanishads. You have six schools of classical philosophy. You have two Mahakavyas, etc. and goes on and on and on. So many gods. I mean, after all, we started with one, then with three, then we have millions of God. At some point, our Dev Sankhya must have been larger than our Jan Sankhya. We had so many gods, and we could put them into the sort of go down. And if one God didn't work, uh, we could go and uh, get one, some more effective one. Sure, this was, this is what we were. We lived by this plurality, and we seemed to be. And sadly, this pluralism is also being undermined by the educated middle classes. Having said that, let me stop it before the signal comes. Thank you. We are extremely grateful to our partners, Herbert Marquesa Society, as well as Raza Foundation, and of course, India International Center. And I think now the tone is exactly right to begin with our inaugural panel. And so I would like to hand over the session to Dr. Ritu Shatavari. Thank you, Sanjana. And uh, I apologize in advance for uh, the horse croaking that I'm going to do for next two minutes. Um, I once again join hands with all the organizers of Creative Theory Colloquium, the 10th edition, in welcoming everyone here. The concept note has been circulated in the form of booklet. Please do look it up because we are expecting a lot of questions and deliberations and discussion on the thematic of this year's edition of Creative Theory Colloquium. 
we collectively plan to deliberate on the ideas of pluralism and relationality in contemporary times, whereby we look at both the theory and praxis of pluralism and relationality. The idea of pluralism emanates for us out of diversity and multiplicity of existences and has, of course, both ontological and epistemological manifestations in areas of philosophy, culture, science, and politics. Relationality, on the other hand, is what we decipher as human relations in their philosophical, social, political, economic forms as a human reality based out of reciprocity. The present edition of Creative Theory Colloquium seeks forth to explore the myriad aspects of pluralistic relational world. And in that sense of the term, today we are beginning with our inaugural session, which focuses on the paradigm shift that social sciences are experiencing in contemporary times. Whether it will lead to transformative social sciences is the question that we all are trying to grapple with. For this session, we have the question of social sciences standing at a pivotal juncture, navigating rapid global shifts. Many established paradigms deeply entrenched in dominant social science frameworks influenced by global economic forces are under meticulous scrutiny. And we hope to have a part of scrutiny as a, as a process of this colloquium with us. The speakers for the session, I'll just briefly introduce and uh, in the in the way I introduced, that's the also that that's the order of the speakers. For this session, we have Professor Sham Menon with us, who's currently the Vice Chancellor of BML Munjal University. He's a distinguished practitioner of institutional development and uh, institutionalization of higher education. He has been a professor of the University of Delhi, and he has also been a former Vice Chancellor at Ambedkar University, Delhi. He is currently also with, he's also the chairman of the Commission for Reforms in Higher Education constituted by the government of Kerala. The second speaker of this session is Professor Rup Manjiri Ghosh, who is the former vice chancellor of Shivnada University. And she has also been a distinguished personality in the field of academics. She has been with JNU and she has served with many, uh, at many uh, schools at many schools of distinguished note, uh, including the School of Physical Sciences at JNU. She is well known for her stand and efforts to support the cause of gender, justice, and environment consciousness in the higher education system. The third speaker for the day is Professor Arnold Farr, who is joining us from the US. He is the founder of International Herbert Marcuse Society and currently is at University of Kentucky. He has authored many works and he is, uh, his research focus is on German idealism, Marxism, critical theory, philosophy of race, postmodernism, psychoanalysis, and liberation philosophy. The fourth speaker for the day is Professor Rajiv Bhargava, who is currently the director of Institute of Indian Thought, CSTS Delhi, where he has been uh, since 2005. And uh, again, he, his work and his uh, Research has been well known to all of us who study social sciences. His publications, including Individualism in Social Sciences, What is Political Theory and Why Do We Need It? The Promise of Indian Secular Democracy have been path defining works. He will be the last speaker of the session. The chair of the session needs no introduction, but I will do it nonetheless. We have Professor Gopal Guru, formerly the professor at Center for Political Studies, JNU, and also the former editor of Economic and Political Weekly. Uh, he has held many positions of note and distinction in his long academic career. He has pioneered many dimensions of new thinking in Dalit discourse with the introduction of critical theory in understanding questions of construction and fallout of Dalit identity in India. His publications, like humiliation, claims and context, the cracked mirror, a trophy in Dalit politics, and others like experiences, caste, and everyday social. These have been, again, path uh, defining works in their genre. I invite all the panelists to the
to take the center stage now and uh, invite them to begin the session. I hand over the proceedings to the chair now, Professor Gopal Guru. Thank you. Can it come up to this point? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rituja, for introducing me in very nice words. Uh, I don't really require any surplus introduction. I mean, it actually can lead to some kind of. So if you doubt your doubting is not desirable, and that should be the starting point of your creative theory. You must really try to learn that you minimize your surplus introduction. To the, so I always tell Rituja that give me one line, give give one line introduction of mine, because doubting. Oh, he's not, it's not, it's not good, good for moral health of the personality. Uh, I don't know, uh, do you have any explanation as to why Raju Bhargav is, when is he coming? Is he coming later or what is it? He will come around six, please call him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. So I'm very happy to uh, 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 chair this session. And I'm also very nervous to chair this session because you know you have uh, uh, very eminent sco scholars, speakers to give us some ideas about what is the paradigm shift in social sciences and uh, and how should we go about doing creative social sciences in India. I must over and above this introduction, actually I'm defining my own norms. I must also share with all of you that these speakers. Professor Rajiv Bhagavad, Professor Sham Mainan, Professor Rup Manjari Ghosh. These are uh, scholars, institution builders. We are actually involved themselves in uh, devising, orienting, directing social science thinking in this country on a very transformative mode. They have not only built up institutions in terms of uh, uh, course curriculum, buildings, faculty recruitments, and all that, but they also have put transformative content into what was to be taught in the institution. Sham, of course, has a very uh, different introduction. I don't want to embarrass him by giving some delicate details of his work in Kerala, but so uh, I will leave it uh, and will share it in the private. I only one a couple of points I would like to make. One is uh, uh, that what, how do we do, and this is not the homework that I'm giving you, uh, the panelist. What do you mean by paradigm shift? Is there was there any paradigm shift in 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 terms of imagining social sciences in this country? This is the first point. And uh, a second point is about what do you mean by transformative? The shift and transformation. These are two very very anchoring concepts that we will have to deal with it. And shift of the structures within which content is placed, uh, shift of reciprocity as Ritusha now has just said, re relationality. And we'll have, this is a much debated and complicated term. We'll have some more discussion on this. I don't think this is a straightforward concept. So relationality actually is uh, something which will have uh, both the ethical and the non-ethical practices that we follow knowingly and unknowingly while doing theory and practice in social sciences. So what is it? What is how do we define transformation? What are the conceptual boundaries within which we can actually space this concept of transformation? And I think uh, you will have follow, uh, you can have a different take, uh, Rupa, you, you can have different, but is it a transformation of the self and transformation of the other? And if you require transformation of the self, you might require Ashokji's poetry and Savita's poetry. Uh, because this is the first ethics that we must really summon to our command, that we require to really change ourselves at the individual level. Then only we can do some meaningful social sciences in this country. Poetry is so important. Aesthetic is so important. 
Films are so important. Before you start your discourse on anything, any concept, any complex concept, you must recite poetry. And so that's all. And I do not know whether we should really, uh, really uh, uh, go about celebrating, valorizing intersectionality. I have some um, uh, some reservations about it uh, because it's not a very simple, straightforward concept. As, uh, Ashok ji said, you know, the crisis of thinking or the crisis of too many plural ideas, but there are no, there are no concrete groundings of this idea. So that's the crisis that we face. So intersection, is intersection contributing to this crisis or it is actually resolving the crisis? So, so this ethics of the self mediated through practice of so creative practice of social sciences has to be attained uh, uh, at the level of molding the self, maybe by sharing your experience in the classroom through reciting poetry. And at the second level, you will have to actually uh, uh, bring together some kind of uh, solidarity of thinking by actually achieving, attaining unity of mind by actually decide, by designing discourses that will promote unity of mind. So first level ethics of uh, doing social sciences is to bring people to think together in the classroom and not only, uh, and then they can share their social uh, locations, uh, mulch them together, fusion, and secondly, transfer that fusion into a very creative, uh, transformative, transcendental thinking, all that. So this is what I thought I would share uh, uh, by way of uh, making some introductory remarks. I may not speak in the last. I thought I just took the opportunity to speak in the first. Thank you so much. So, so I will follow the order. Uh, and Professor Shamanan, would you please uh, go ahead? Can I request you to? Yes. Uh, so, uh, how much time? Uh, with you? So, each speaker around twenty-five to thirty minutes. Okay. That's the remote control. That's That's the <laughs> <laughs> One is. Uh, Thank you, thank you, uh, Gopal. Thank you, Professor Guru. Um, one has been long enough in uh, higher education administration uh, to be able to speak on any subject for 15 minutes, but uh, more than 15 minutes is difficult. <laughs> you know that that needs some more insights and something. <laughs> so, um, but when um, I, I I called uh, Tusha yesterday on the phone and uh, she. Is, specifically said, no, it has to be a half an hour. Then I haggled and eventually we arrived at 25 minutes. So, uh, so I have to really uh, stretch myself to uh, uh, talk about for, for about 25 minutes. The thing is, I'm not a social scientist. Um, uh, I'm not a theorist. Um, I, I studied physics and then I um, became a science teacher in school. And then I um, uh, did a master's in education and then uh, got into a faculty of education where I made a living for about 40 years uh, um, preparing teachers to teach in schools. That's what I did. And uh, while doing it, I also did other things like, for instance, curriculum and uh, uh, textbooks and so on. Uh, but uh, I was fortunate that I was located in Delhi University there I where I could actually uh, be in uh, contact with Professor Guru and uh, uh, Rajiv and all the rest. And so forth. therefore, by osmosis, uh, some social sciences must have really gotten in. That's about all. But, uh, and I, I said, I, I'm no, no theorist at all. I, I'm a practitioner. But then I took solace from uh, what uh, Newton, uh, Isaac Newton, has uh, famously said, that there is nothing more practical than a good theory. So uh, I just thought that probably my being a practitioner can also actually uh, contribute to understanding conceptually uh, the, the, the complex, the chaos that we see around. So the seeing patterns when none exist is, the, is, is what uh, theories are about, where explanatory structures are developed and where we're uh, using conceptual categories. And that's what the whole uh, uh, exercise of theory building is all about. 
uh, that's what one does in uh, you know Thomas Kuhn and others are to be believed. That's what happens in the enterprises, natural sciences. So social sciences would be somewhat different because of its normative nature and all that. But all the same, I, I would assume that I think uh, this is the way generally things would happen. Uh, all that was very good. I was uh, from the ringside. I was understanding social sciences. Uh, till in 2008, uh, much to my own surprise, I was asked to set up a University of Social Science in the city of Delhi. I'm sure that they must have really didn't find anybody else. <laughs> you know, that's the reason they, they asked me to do it because I'm neither a social scientist nor have I done this kind of work earlier. So for the next about 10 years, my job was actually to set up uh, this university. So my claim to fame, as, and uh, Professor Mahanti Vini uh, uh, talked to me and said that I should come here, uh, it was very clear that I think, uh, you know, I have this only one story to tell everybody, and that is how I set up the Social Science University. It's a bit like uh, Mark Twain, I'm told, uh, had um, uh, this story to tell all his life. That is when he was a child, there was this big flood in the river Mississippi, and um, there was a lot of calamity in, the, in wherever he was uh, living. And all his life, whenever he had a gathering of five, six people, he would talk about when Mississippi, the river Mississippi was flooded, this happened, this happened, this happened. Anyway, so the story goes, of course, that he died and they went to St. Peter and then St. Peter said that, okay, now you take rest, you've been ill for some time. Then he said, no, 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 I have to talk. I've not been speak, talking to people. Then he called a lot of people around and said that, okay, now speak. So the Mark Twain said, began, the only story he knows that, uh, you know, that uh, when the river Mississippi, <laughs> you know, um, uh, was flooded, this happened. Then the God just nudged, I mean, the St. Peter just nudged him and said, you know, that that bearded guy who was sitting in back in a bored expression, you know who he is? He said, no, he is Noah. Oh. So, I mean, it's like talking to Noah about flood in, in Mississippi River. So it's, I, I, I feel a bit like that. I, my only story I know, I, I'm talking to people who have been writing this story all the time. So, um, in, uh, so I feel a very, very um, nervous. Um, so it was, it was in July 2008, about four, five months before general election of 2008, when Mrs. Dixit was elected, would, would get elected uh, for the third time. And uh, she didn't know, of course, she wanted to make sure. So, uh, so she announced the establishment of Ambedkar University in uh, Delhi. So Ambedkar University is a social science university. Interestingly, so the chief secretary at that point in time called me and said that you can start the university in Najafgarh. Um, there is a Shadika hall which is not used for many years, so you can actually start there. So I uh, I asked him how do we start a university there? He said no, you are you are you are a social science university, you are Ambedkar University, so you can start there. So uh, that is very clear. And then he answered, what about classes? No, no problem. There are government schools around. And then they will be closed in the evening. So you, you to hold evening classes. After all, you are a social science university, or Ambedkar University, aren't you? So, uh, <laughs> so what, what I'm trying to, this is no exaggeration, by the way. This happened. Um, so I, I was too new to this job. So I couldn't even give the right kind of answers. And I was actually quite confused and uh, fuming and livid and everything, but um, decided that I'm not going to do this. And uh, the good advice came from many people saying that, you know, the, you are, the expectation from this university is after all, there is too many social science, um, uh, you know, the aspirants for social science uh, undergraduate uh, colleges, uh, courses in the colleges of Delhi University. There's a huge spillover, the, the cutoff and all that. So uh, you start something which would actually assimilate some of these spillovers. So expectation of this university is very low. Najab Gad, Shadi Kamandab, and the evening classes, rural, <laughs> Ambedkar University, social sciences, and, and all that put together. And uh, the, the, so we decided that we will not do any of this. So we wouldn't even start with an undergraduate program. We will start with PhD program and, and, uh, and, uh, and postgraduate programs. And postgraduate programs are also in areas where these people have never heard of. So before Ashoka and all these people came up, we were the ones who started development studies, public policy, governance, uh, and uh, the citizen law governance and citizenship, human ecology, uh, uh, psychosocial clinical studies, and, and several others. 
And uh, the, this, fortunately, Mrs. Dixit had to be appreciated. But once this concept note was presented to her, then, uh, uh, then she was a, a great votary and an ambassador for our cause. And once that word came from her, the bureaucracy knew that they have to throw in line. I also, the, the, those few months, I learned a lot of lessons about how bureaucratic state and political state are together and not together at the same time. So this is a very delicate uh, kind of a uh, art. Someday I would like to write a, letter, a handbook of dealing with government. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, uh, the, uh, what, where we thought we should do is actually we wanted to conceptually climb. By the way, the, my teammate, the major teammate was a theoretical physicist, uh, Professor Vijay Varma. And, uh, and the, both of us had an interest in school education and school science education. That's how we came together. But he was the dean planning in Delhi University, and he was the one who actually, along with me, uh, uh, designed this university. So we were very clear that uh, there is a difference between market demand and uh, and uh, social needs. So there may not be mobilized market demand for everything, but it's a, you know, we are not a polytechnic, we are a university. If we are a polytechnic, we would have just catered to a market demand and started something in it. The major market demand at that point in time was to create uh, uh, prospective teachers for social science courses in Delhi University colleges. So it's a, like a, like a, uh, how do you put it? Uh, it it's, it's very, in that sense, very um, um, uh, inwardly looking kind of a thing. The social sciences creating more social science uh, teachers who will create more social science students and so on. So um, we thought that we shouldn't do any of those. So the initial master's program we started were all of the, not this kind. None of them will actually create jobs for uh, uh, teachers of Delhi University. Fortunately, we had uh, people like Professor Manurajan Mandi to talk to, and he really helped us. He, in fact, was the midwife along with all of us who birthed the first program of the uh, of the university along with along with you. And uh, we started this diploma program in uh, in uh, development studies uh, for the first time in Delhi. There was no development studies program at that point in time anywhere. So the, uh, the 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 what we were highlight uh, enunciating was this principle that if there are if there are areas where are no social demand, uh, market demand, it is the university's responsibility to mobilize such a demand by creating a supply. So it's not as though the demand creates a supply, but supply sometimes creates demand, and that's precisely what happened to some of our courses later. In human ecology course, for instance, when we started, we had 25 seats, we couldn't fill 10 in the first year. And uh, our uh, board of management members uh, said, no, 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 we should discontinue. We said, no, the universities are such that one assembly line doesn't work for two years. We can't really dis discontinue the assembly line. We have to stay invested in it. So we stayed invested. Today, I'm told, at least at the time I left, the, the ratio of uh, people who applied to this course and the seats available was 1 is to 10. So what I'm trying to say is that that is a this is a principle which one uh, uh, one really enunciated there. Second is actually that there is a lot of uh, scope for working in the interface of the state and the civil society because um, uh, th there is to be a time in the, the people who who manage the executive in the state, particularly the All India Civil Service, where a large number of them came from the social sciences, but then because of this proliferation of IITs and particularly those branches of IITs where the jobs are not like very lucrative. Not everybody gets one crore package to begin with, right? So some of them will come to the Indian civil service. So the civil service is now completely people from uh, IITs. The problem with this is that in IITs, because they have passed one, pro one examination already, and when UPSC, they pass a second examination already. So they're twice born people, you know, <laughs> in a thrice born rather. <laughs> Thrice bond. So, I mean, they know everything. So, you can't really talk anything to them because they are from IITs, you know. And then, uh, so th this actually has at created at that point in time. I'm talking about 2008, which was a different India. That, at that point in time, a lot of very uh, um, uh, alert civil society organizations who needed capacity building. So, we thought some of our programs actually should act could create personnel for the civil society organizations. 
um, I'll come to the to the end of my presentation. I'll say what happens if this assumption is not true. The assumption here is very clear that um, 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 that we, we have a um, we have a um, uh, the Constitution of India is actually the the major uh, um, not merely the the statement of the statement of how, who we are but actually also an assertion of where we want to be. So uh, it, it, in that sense, the, the preamble also uh, in, uh, uh, states very clearly the aspirations. So in, in, that, in that sense, it's a, it's a transformatory instrument. It's not an instrument, it's not a law rule book. It is, it's more a transformatory instrument. And we felt that the, the interface of the state and the civil society is where I think uh, the constitutionally mandated social transformation needs to be pushed and needs to be facilitated, and there need to be co competent people who can do that, who are who are not entrenched in single disciplines and who do not can't talk to one another, but who are uh, who are uh, socialized and brought up and trained in multiple disciplines and are able to comprehend and work with people from various other disciplines. So th this is roughly the naive kind of a. Uh, uh, a thing which uh, you know assumption with which we 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 went ahead. Uh, so I, I'll, I, how much time do I? Have? Uh, I didn't look at the watch. I just how much do, time do I have? Yeah, I just, five minutes. Five minutes only. <laughs> ten. Ten minutes. Okay. I said five. Anyway, you can take ten. Ten more minutes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. Um, in five minutes, I'll say something, and then the last five minutes, I'll say something else. <laughs> so the first five minutes, I would like to say that uh, we uh, not just, uh, you know, we, we we structured our schools in a certain manner because we did not want disciplines to get entrenched. So we had schools which are indivisible spaces, which had um, uh, which had programs located in it, and these programs were for finite time frame timeline. Uh, a life, life, uh, life lifespan. So programs can be dismantled and made again. So if uh, if a development studies is not valid anymore after about fifteen years, we dismantle development studies, put something else together. So for this, it was important for the faculty recruitment hiring process to be a little more flexible. So we had this system of concurrent appointments. It's interesting that uh, that people who are appointed more than one program or school at the same time, so they move. Uh, um, you know, from one to another, and they are multi participate in multiple programs and so on. So, in, in 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 so doing, and with limited budget, when we did it, the what happened to us actually, we had a development studies. Uh, I'll give you an example. The human ecology uh, program had one anthropologist, two economists, one political ecologist, one uh, uh, you know one uh, en environmental uh, scientist, and one historian, one environmental historian. So we assumed that these five people or six people will be able to, uh, you know, gel together. Then through osmosis, they will actually develop some overall comprehensive understanding of the problems because it didn't happen. That doesn't happen. They, it doesn't happen for the following reason because pe these people in ones and twos can't really work. One historian can't work. You have to have a, a critical number of historians to work together with them, and and similarly others. The, the entrenchment of their disciplines they are uh, trained in is one major force. And it is not just an epistemological issue, it's also a sociological thing. You have to be in the company of people who, who are, who are uh, trained in a similar manner as you are. You know, that, that, that gives you the comfort. So all these things we did not know at that point in time. So we, we tried to develop these little, little schools and little, little programs. Today, if, if I were to do this again, I would have had a different conception. Um, so this is one second actually that we look for people who had uh, 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 who had specializations in more than one disciplines. We, we didn't like people who are entrenched in one discipline. We always had somebody uh, somebody who has done a, a master's in one, PhD in something else, or or things like that. So nagharka naghatka kind of approach. I mean these these people are good because they had a they had a built-in discomfiture of working in one single disciplinary area. So they had to they had a certain inbuilt restlessness to to reach out to others and so on. And this worked out well. Many many people who actually came in, uh, uh, you know, they did they developed very interesting relationships 
between uh, with colleagues from other uh, disciplines and have some very interesting work has come out of their collaboration. I, I'll now come to another end, I mean, uh, another point and finish. See, um, um, you know, social sciences um, um, is okay in a democratic society because it has, a, it has a job, it has a job to do, it has a critical job to do. Um, in a society which is actually, or a polity which is actually slipping out of democracy, they have little patience for social sciences. Because nobody wants it. I remember this happening in 1996 when uh, district primary education program was going on in the country. And then we went to the gen then joint secretary in the Ministry of Human Resource Development, very nice person. We met him and said that we have come here to give you some suggestions. And we were all from universities and some were from NGOs. So he said, okay, so uh, we are critical friends of the district primary education program. So he said, he looked at us, smiled and said that, Make up your mind. Either you are critical or you are a friend. So, so this uh, when it comes to uh, you know the knowledge systems, either you can be critical or you can be a friend. I mean, there are social scientists who have always thought that they are more part of the state than others. The economist is a good example. Economists thought that they were running the Indian state uh, for for a long time. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and 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 they they had this comfort of actually coming out and going in. They're part of the state and yet not part of the state, and they could actually get appointed as a chief economic advisor or something like that, and then come out and again teach in a university and so on. So that luxury they had, but are not others. So this um, this dual nature of this entire thing makes this entire enterprise somewhat difficult to uh, difficult to sustain in a in a society which is becoming less and less democratic. Second is actually this that. Uh, uh, you know, all this entire assumption of something like Ambedkar University we could build because we went with the assumption and that assumption proved to be right, that the state was more or less sincere in working with civil society, in actually using constitution as an instrument and bringing about some kind of social change. RTE, uh, right to education came at that time, right to information came at that time, the Mahatma Gandhi uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme came at that point in time and so on. So all these were in a way, a, a, uh, it was a, like a double engine, double engine of the civil society and the state put together, uh, creating transformation. Today we have double engines of various kinds, other other kinds. So, but that this was the double engine which was working at that point in time. But today we have, uh, or we possibly are going into a state where uh, where uh, the state itself is at, is beginning to consider its own institutions as in antagonistic terms. And uh, and when civil society also in antagonistic terms or civil society of a certain hue in antagonistic terms and so on. And if that's the case, then how exactly can we build institutions of this kind in the public space? This is a question which I find very uh, very little answer to. Well, no, no answer to. And I, I would also say one more thing and stop. See this entire process, um, public institutions in higher education, particularly um, becoming a difficult place to work in, particularly for social sciences. Um, I, 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 fear, I, I see two things. One is this, that scholarship, good scholarship coming out of institutions, universities would actually dry up after some time in a, in a matter of about 10 years, 15 years, perhaps. It will dry up after some time. Um, but it doesn't matter because, uh, because if there is a uh, the, there is scope for good scholarship to come in, it will find expression anywhere, if not in universities, but somewhere else. Ramchandra Guhas of this world have been working from outside the university, you know, so the, we will the, we'll also find ways of working outside of institutions. So that's a possibility. But what is more dangerous, more difficult, actually, is the assembly line is drying up. You must remember one thing, economy, economics in India, people like Amartya Sen or Sugumay Chakrabarti or uh, people, stalwarts like that could do what they could. Not because of the PhDs they did wherever they did, or the D school, Delhi School of Economics masters, but because of a solid undergraduate economics they did in Presidency College with Tapas Majumdar as their teacher. That that so that is something which is actually uh, is is going to affect when when the assembly line gets dried up, then I think there won't be any good takers for um, for intellectual work, and that's already is the case. I. I I work in a university where actually, actually we uh, uh, in, 
uh, the, all that we do in social sciences at the moment left to itself is actually uh, uh, enabling people to get a visa and go to uh, Amherst, UMass, Amherst. And that if that brings about social transformation in India, so be it. But uh, otherwise, this is what's going to happen. But of course, we struggle and bring people other, of other kind also into, into it through philanthropic and other kinds of mobilization so that people, others also can come who can't afford hammers can also, also do stuff here. Uh, but and we should create an opportunity for that as well. It's a struggle. Nothing like a public institution. There is no substitution for public institution. And if public institutions are drying up, then I think social sciences are the first ones to feel the heat. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shamanan Pariva. Very honest and and the first part of the passionate uh, presentation. You raised a number of points uh, for for the deliberation. Uh, you try to underline the role and attitude of the state towards social sciences. Uh, and towards the end of your speech, you said uh, you actually hinted at different uh, uh, deep sitting problems like drying of assembly lines. Uh, social scientists, scholars, researchers are becoming official intellectuals. And uh, if that is the case, if that is the crisis that one is actually looking at, then what kind of uh, transformative social sciences one is designing, one is expecting? Can you really expect any kind of a critical conceptual categories coming from these statist official intellectuals? If the source of any, if, if, if the epistemological source of any concept formation or space is the experience, reality happening there, uh, we will actually have a serious problem of really reimagining social science with the kind of people that we we find with the power, rather than against the power. So that's a serious note uh, you are uh, uh, shared with us. Thank you so much. Uh, you could have taken two more minutes, but good. Thank you. Now, now I request uh, Rupa to uh, uh, you can take about 20 minutes, and I think uh, the three people, Madhuri, can watch. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, Riti, Riti Shah, because I don't really look at the watch. I'm a bad chairperson. I'll take uh, this. Yeah. Okay. So it's now, uh, we can. Okay. Oh, six. Six or five there. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's really an honor for me to be here this uh, in this forum with you. I come from a hardcore science background, and it is just beginning to end. And then I was in JNU School of Physical Sciences uh, when the school started. Uh, became the dean there. It's by rotation, as you know. A lot of things happened during my days in JNU, but then. I uh, left JNU and I went to this new university being built, Shibnada University. And uh, when I got invited to this panel, I thought first it was a mistake. Then I got a WhatsApp okay. from Monindra saying, give me your number and, uh, you know, please come. And I also talked to a social science colleague of mine from SNU. And saying that, you know, what am I going to say here? They're all really very eminent social scientists. But then they thought there must be some value in what the way we designed, for example, the curriculum at Srivnada University. And some of the things that I'm going to say, and what caught my attention was uh, this entire, the, the talk about uh, relationality. I don't know uh, social science at all. I mean, I've been neighbors with some great social scientists in GNU, so again, of course, is yeah. Gopal Guru sitting right here, but did not learn much. Well, in my simple physics terms, what I understood is that disciplinary identities only emerge in and through appearing before other disciplines, right? And not prior to it. So uh, disciplinary identities are relational. 
I'm going to bore you to death with some generalities about multidisciplinary uh, teaching and learning and research and innovation. And I want to mean it in this language of yours, because I think I understand only that bit fairly well. The second qualifying remark is that I'm not going to speak only about social sciences. Allow me to start by making some generic comments from my experiences because uh, they are the big picture ones. They apply to social science as well. That's my belief. So let me get started because you know uh, I've been speaking at various places, so I have some notes and I'll just see how it goes. Some obvious remark is about higher education uh, in general, not just social science, what we want to celebrate. And I mean, uh, you know, I have a lot of idealism still left. So I think that we wish to celebrate the uniqueness of each in individual in the higher education system by encouraging creative freedom. And that has always a problem. That's what bothers uh, maybe the governments or other uh, influencers that you want to avoid anarchy, but want to encourage creative freedom. There is a fine line between the two. So as an institution builder, you should be aware of that. In all of this, this is not primary education uh, in people who are in higher education, I think are privileged ones. And uh, only reason for being here is pursuing your definition of excellence. Keeping this in mind and this peak of excellence is a very fragile peak. So you can actually bring it down to mediocrity very, very quickly when the overall median is quite low. So these are things people talk about a lot in describing the higher education scene. Let me, I read the concept note very clearly. It talks about the, what is private and what is public or state supported. Let me address that keeping these two points I just made in view. First, what is philanthropy? This is a very new concept in India. Uh, there is a phrase probably all of you know, give a man a fish, and you feed him for a day, teach him to fish, or to, I would say, to form a fishery cooperative, and you feed him for a lifetime. So this aim captures what is at the heart of the difference between charity and philanthropy, right? So it's not for a day. A philanthropic interventions are uh, meant for empowerment and self-sustainment, when not just one-time giving. So why philanthropy? And this is something I did not know when I left JNU, and I've been at SNU for 10 years. So an independent philanthropic sector, that's what I, I believe because of the turn of events in the country, an independent philanthropic sector can take risks, maybe calculated risk, that's what my job was. And you can experiment towards excellence. Sham just talked about it. You can experiment. Something the government sector, I would expect because they use taxpayers' money, may not be free to do. You want to go on tested paths. So I think Jane was an exception, and I don't want to talk about it. It would take me days, actually, to talk about, analyze what I believe has gone right or wrong, whatever. So we are, of course, talking about, I'm talking about ideal situations here. In practice, there can be aberrations on both private and public domains. So if you look at philanthropic sectors, which are are new in India. This is what we want. Uh, philanthropic education institutions, there is no profit motive. And the place I worked in, Shibnader Foundation, did not take a penny out of the university. They paid 200 crores every year and, uh, and so on and so forth. So the main motive for these kind of philanthropy has been creating the legacy. So this needs understanding of what I just uh, said about philanthropy. The only deliverable, therefore, is impact by excellence in uh, teaching, learning, and research and innovation. So uh, I'm not sure I can say this about the public sector today. The only motive is excellence in teaching, learning, and research and innovation. Uh, one vice chancellor comes for five years or three years, something happens, then the next one, there is no continuity of vision. The students are the mercy of the system. So uh, when 
I received, to be honest, when I received the offer from SNU, I was at JNU and I did not know Shubhnada at all. I was very skeptical, almost scared of the uh, private sector. It was, of course, a difficult phase because uh, the corporate brass, while focused and efficient in their own domains, were new to higher education. They did not quite understand what it entailed. But after 10, 11 years in a private research university, I'm now scared of the public sector. So I think we need to sort of figure out what is it that I really would like it to be, what we need to do to keep there, because I believe there's a lot that one needs to do. So let me dial back a bit, go back to the plurality of disciplinary in the disciplinary connect that I want to talk about. So my assertion 10 years back, was that university with multidisciplinary research-led character will address many of the current issues. Now, the, when I read the term paradigm shift, the chair mentioned that uh, I, I'm quite familiar with this in the physics domain, but I'll not talk about it unless there is a reference that a question comes. But paradigm shift in higher education in general has been happening worldwide. And though all of you know, let me just remind ourselves that Industry 4.0 is supposed to be the disruptive to, because it's a, to a lagging education sector. The uncertainty was about future of work. Everybody talked about future of work. Uh, we no, no longer need university graduates to contribute to the labor force of the country. Machines can perform their road jobs and thinking jobs too. Thanks to artificial intelligence, you know, many of the decision makings are we are delegating on a daily basis to AI, whether you know it or not. Give, give you a simple example. When you are going from one place to another place that you know, uh, you still look at Google Map. Because uh, you know the place, uh, there is nothing that's unknown there, but you want real time uh, data on traffic. You want many other road conditions and so on and so forth. So decision making, which path you should take, you've actually left to Google Map. This is a silly example, but it's a day-to-day -day thing. It's happening more and more. Big decisions are being left to uh, not uh, people like us, but to machines, which of course are programmed by people. It's a big debate. I don't want to get into that, but the, the fear for all of us in the education sector is, will an algorithm take your job? So whatever can be coded can be done by a machine. So we need to figure out what are humans still good for? What are the things that machines still cannot do? I give you two answers and there are many, actually you can, not many, several, you can actually put to your own. So uh, social intelligence, for example, is far from being fully automated. Humans also have the edge over machines in what I would call real creativity. So after Industry 4.0, now we are talking about Industry 5.0. The focus lies in interaction between humans and uh, machines, right? So uh, this is uh, there's a personal human touch to Industry 4.0 pillars of automation and efficiency. And this is already here. So I think one thing is to keep your eyes shut and say, well, uh, I'll keep doing what I've been doing. Paradigm shift, the, the reason for that to come in is because you are being challenged from all sides. And I think I can do whatever, you know, self-introspection, as Rupal mentioned, but I can't gamble on my students. The time they graduate, they have four years at least in our undergraduate program. And by the time they go out of our university system, which is kind of protected, out in the market, uh, the outside world would change beyond recognition. So I think this is something that, how do you prepare your graduates? And I'm talking about both undergraduate and PhD. That's what we did at Shivnara University. Our undergraduates did research. We started with an undergraduate program, had a lot of flexibility in this multidisciplinary way. And uh, it would need more than the time to, be, to get into the details of it. We refined it over years. And it was totally focused on the learners. Teachers were, you know, change from being the stage on the stage to guide by the side, or sometimes what I call the middle in the middle. So your role had actually completely changed. 
it is totally focused on the youth. And when I think of that, I don't feel depressed at all. Whatever comes, I think there is always an optimism, there is a hope. If you channelize them in the right direction, the right direction is not na a narrow concept. It's not just the one thing that is to, left to be done, but it should be, we, we should be aware of where these machines are actually uh, taking us there. So there, this, of course, was an existential problem, I would say, in higher education. There are a lot of people that are taking shortcuts, I would say, through micro credentials and all of it. I don't want to get into that debate. We'll win, hands down. But I'm just concentrating on the university education, which is kind of holistic and which is kind of futuristic, is looking ahead. So we needed, of course, to change our focus from creating what I call a labor force to producing creative leaders who will have the ability to generate innovative solutions, especially in the face of complex or changing situations. So the question was, what is the right kind of university education that will prepare them and give them this ability. One simple thing that I can tell you that is that if you promote, for example, project-based or problem-based hands-on and also purpose-based learning, I don't have the time to define each one of these, but you can tap into the potential of connecting your left brain, which is the verbal, analytical, and orderly to the right brain, which is visual and intuitive. And then that kind of an education which connects these two parts, because the right brain is far from being coded. You would be ahead of uh, this challenge, the future of education that everybody is talking about. So I just come very quickly uh, to what does it require today? Again, in very general terms. For me, you know, the the overarching things that I can talk about. One is sustainability. Sustainability in the private sector, people assume that it's all about money. It's not. I talk about financial as well as intellectual sustainability, and that has been hinted at by Sham already. So this uh, we have uh, scarcity of resources, no doubt about it. Nowhere in the world research institutions survive on student fees alone. Nowhere. But Nobody has come up with a good financial model either, but we need to actually look for sources other than just keep on increasing student fees to meet uh, the, the, the expensive research that uh, even people like us do. So I think there, there are ways of it, and that may be uh, another debate somewhere to talk about it, how exactly without increasing student fees and making uh, education not affordable, that's not the idea. So the, the access and quality and affordability, these three things in higher education, everybody's talking about mostly lip service, but we need to actually see it. And I see private sector, particularly the philanthropic sector coming up in a big way is one solution, one part of the solution. India would need many more. So one is sustainability. Second issue is competent leadership. This is something we somehow do not talk about. If you have Sham sitting in here, actually almost all people in this side, they have actually led and done something and contributed to institution building. This is difficult because as I said in higher education, uh, you know, you are not that focused and by design, not because you are lousy. Uh, I mean, I, if I tell you army and think of leadership, one quality only, most of my students would say discipline, discipline. You know, they get the job done. There is an order and you actually execute that. Business, I have already hinted at that, you know, corporate people, they're very efficient, but they have a focus target. Once I have told the ship in, a, um, in, a, in an open house that they have very narrow targets, and he corrected me saying not narrow, focused. <laughs> I, I don't, I, but, you know, so I'm just putting them as contrast. That, you know, one, you have discipline, you have very focused targets, and higher education is like this wild forest by design. It's not because you're lousy. It's by design. It's ought to be the, that way. How do you build a system out of such a thing? Because where individuals are important, uh, but you still want a system out of it because we are talking about universities, the institutions. So leadership is about engaging people to build a community. So how do you build a community? There are a lot of... Uh, 
news items I'm sure you're seeing about universities uh, in trouble for all the wrong reasons, you know, they're in the news. Uh, there are ways of handling such crisis. It happens everywhere. It happens everywhere. And therefore, in my view, we need to talk about leadership a little more often in this forum. What exactly does it take to have a good social science institution, for example, which is going through this paradigm shift? What kind of leadership do you actually need to, to it's not to dictate it, to make sure that you have the freedom. Some codes are necessary. Uh, some norms are to be followed. And the best thing that I summarize in my own experience is that you take out the fire before it breaks. Nobody gets to know. There is no hoo-ha about it then. You don't get any credit because you have taken out the fire that you only saw. And nobody gets to see it, what you have done. But I think we need a lot of proactive planning at the leadership level and more now than anywhere else so that people who are good at whatever they're good at are free to do their job. Where are those leaders in the academic field today? Higher education needs to be managed by professionals and I call ourselves professionals. And it's not by anybody else. It has to be higher education professionals who would manage this particular sector. Now, I don't need to give you the definitions of multidisciplinarity, which can lead, then lead to interdisciplinarity. Ultimately, that would get to what everybody is talking about is transdisciplinarity beyond boundaries. So kind of multidisciplinary is like additive. You add the disciplines together, look at the same problem from different disciplines. Interdisciplinary is kind of integrated, uh, interactive integration. And transdisciplinarity is a holistic creation beyond disciplines and so on and so forth. So I think that is something, this uh, relationality and plurality that today we'll be talking about in terms of the disciplines is extremely important for me. I coined a phrase in the uh, Shivnada. We used to call our you know, innovative curriculum STEAM. Everybody's talking about it, but way back, where STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, this abbreviation, these kind of subjects were uh, uh, coupled with innovation in the last century. In STEAM, you add that extra A for art and design, but it's symbolic. It doesn't just mean art and design. And the E standing for maybe enterprise education. They take the other E out, and we feel that that's what is needed to give our students clear advantage in the face of the worldwide challenge of future of work. Uh, so in the last one minute, what I want to talk about is it's about content and its delivery. And you know, the delivery has to be student-centric. By student-centric, I mean it's active knowledge, right? So learning by doing, you doing. You know, it's not a science, science way, though of course my language is kind of a physics language. We, I started a program uh, very fondly called our program, OUR, Opportunities for Undergraduate Research. My well, would know his, his son did it. Uh, so this was uh, necessary because it's exploration there for fun. You are uh, generating knowledge yourself, uh, guided by everybody else. For that, when there is a problem on ground, it doesn't say I belong to NCRT chapter eight. You need to have tools from all disciplines to be able to solve that problem. And the problem doesn't necessarily mean a technological problem, any problem. So, uh, you know, uh, so this is something that uh, occurred to us. And we also found several of the crises that the world is facing where things are uh, can be solved when sociologists or I would say policymakers uh, rub shoulders with scientists. One example, if you look it up, that SME we started a program on uh, water science and policy. Uh, architect was Dr. Mahisha, but water science, science and policy is a little ahead of its time. Uh, I also in my academic council we passed a program that got started now. Uh, it's on rural management, for example. If you look at uh, the program, rural management is a little delayed start. Uh, the water program was a little ahead of its time. So if you see that, this couldn't have been designed just by social scientists or just by scientists. The problem actually, these kind of issues needed thinking of academicians from all disciplines to come together, government agencies, NGOs, uh, and practitioners uh, of, uh, on ground. So I think this is something that we uh, we kept inventing and trying to do by using this multidisciplinary character. Uh, so 
the, this also would address, for example, the connection of uh, livelihood with education, which was extremely, I mean, I believe in that from primary to all, you can't really not think of livelihood issues. Uh, of course, there is a third part there uh, talking about entrepreneurship that I have not talked about at all. But are you finding your dream job? Are you creating it was the question that I would be asking my students. So some it, it suits some. It's not compulsory, but you know, today's students are actually doing it, but I don't think all of them should be doing social media algorithms. They should be actually solving problems that the world is waiting for. So I make a distinction in my terminology between uh, innovation, which has this commercial idea, and invention, which are of the big kind that people uh, have been waiting for. And we have seen that when COVID happened, uh, these kind of lax one events are, it's not like it's a one-off event. These are going to happen. You need to be prepared for it. And what kind would come next, nobody knows. So we need to be actually prepared for a future that you do not know about. But I'm not scared because with a multidisciplinary education, it doesn't mean you go do interdisciplinarity at the cost of disciplinarity. You go deep into something. And if the context changes, you still have the tools to go deep into some, the problem that is at hand today. And therefore, the students should be trained to do this when they go out and the world changes in front of them. Needless to say, I mean, you know, I had written out a lot of more problem points, but uh, for later times, the key focus has to be on faculty. Uh, whatever we are doing, this is something, you know, if this one piece you get right, you get everything else right. So the focus has to be on the faculty. You need to continuously build your capacity also. So uh, the last point is that the university systems cannot be just uh, global. You know, you are always looking to the global scenes. Uh, I borrowed the term called local, where you are global, but you're deeply rooted in your local context. Anybody who has visited Shivnara University campus would know where we are located and what we are doing around uh, the university campus. The last point is uh, about success, how to measure it. And this is something that is what is eating up us. Ranking. A ranking by uniform parameters kills your risk taking abilities. It also makes you, uh, you know, forget your journey. Each one of us have a separate curve that we are following as institutions. And I think India needs that more than any other country right now in this particular uh, uh, group of uh, countries that I'm thinking about. If you judge by uniform standards or try to mimic another institution, or you rank by uniform parameters, you make the university risk averse and it stops the growth catering to contextual issues. So I, you know, to in, in the benefit for the benefit of students, you need accreditation. I mean, you need uh, a stamp of approval before our students get cheated. So that's necessary. But ranking cannot be only of one kind. We need several kinds of ranking. And ultimately what is boiled down if you look at, I have talked about it in JNU a lot, the uh, need to combine the priorities of abstract knowledge generation and excellence versus uh, the relevant or contextual or uh, market research and innovation that's linked with an economic agenda. I don't have anything against this. Honestly, I think it's important. We have also done it, but you know, sometimes, the uh, unexpected benefits of blue sky or abstract or futuristic research cannot be under, understated. That's essential in the country's quest to become a leader in today's knowledge economy. So uh, the only way forward for this is a competent peer review process. Now that's highly subjective. It's not by new numerals, one, two, zero, one, et cetera. So I think this is something we cannot shed off. You know, as a community, we have to shoulder this responsibility of a competent peer review process. And therefore, I go back to what I said, that higher education needs to be managed by professionals. Uh, so thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I end with another provocative remark. Uh, I hope you would have questions on this later. In 2010, and the book Grand Design, Stephen Hawking argued that philosophy is dead. You remember? Uh, yes. Uh, well, not a philosopher, he provided arguments that philosophers have not taken science sufficiently seriously. And so philosophy is no longer relevant to knowledge claims. 
So in, a, uh, in interviews with journalists, he had said, philosophy as practiced nowadays is a waste of time, philosophers a waste of space. It was provocative, and I believe he eventually withdrew this comment. He's no longer here, so I don't want to uh, comment on that. But the, the point is about staying relevant and not in silos. Uh, that's disciplinarity is also required, but your disciplinary definition comes from in this multidisciplinary framework. That's the pluralistic framework for the curriculum that I'm uh, preaching for. So I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, uh, Rupa Pariva. A very uh, insightful presentation. I would like to connect your presentation to what uh, Shyam was saying about the, uh, the state doesn't have patience for social sciences. <laughs> if that is the case, should we how should we follow your roadmap, uh, your suggestions? That's for the audience to decide. The two major points that you're making uh, were uh, you try to focus on this paradigm shift in terms of uh, uh, the need to disentangle human being from machine. And that's one paradigm shift. And uh, and I would add to your, uh, your, your, your focus that uh, the, the, the concept of creativity lies Maybe I would say many, many, many of you may not agree with me, right. not in terms of interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity, but but transcendenting yes. disciplines. Because in transcendence, uh, you are uh, uh, in the process of transcending from one discipline to another wider area of investigation. You are uh, you are tentative. You are more exploratory. And uh, you are still searching. So I think uh, there are in inbuilt limits in this transcendence. Uh, and so uh, when there are limits, there is a possibility of being creative. The poet would actually follow this route. And uh, uh, the second point uh, that I would like to trace from your presentation is this: that you know uh, uh, the uh, the, the 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 artificial intelligence uh, is a problem basically if you look at it from the human point of view why it is a problem because you know it 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 doesn't really uh, it displaces a human being a thinking being from the whole framework and you have actually underlined that very very succinctly and and so i think uh, uh, this is artificial intelligence in, in certain senses, just simulation of data and information. I mean, the heaps of data is imposed on students and they are actually trying to do it right in the classroom. Uh, and whereas human being has a limited, and so there's, a fi, there's a finite knowledge uh, capacity with the students in the faculty. And again, creativity lies, it succeeds in finite knowledge capacity. And not in infinite. And simulation is mindlessly infinite. And I think we should resist this. And you, you, you did a wonderful uh, experiment in in uh, when you were there. And we can talk about uh, your alternatives to uh, rural transformation and and local and all that. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. And now uh, may I request uh, the third person uh, to the professor. Arnold Farr, are you, can you hear? Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. May I invite you to uh, uh, to please uh, make a presentation? And as you know, I'm not uh, so. Uh, it's just uh, 20 minutes you have to your disposal and to make your points. Thank 25 you. Five um, maybe 25 maybe. Yeah. Good. Okay. Good. Please go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. And I want to uh, thank my sister, Savita, and all the other organizers for inviting me to be a part of this event. Uh, I just have a few comments or ideas I want to put on the table. So the topic, um, unveiling the paradigm shift towards the transformative social sciences in contemporary times, um, is, is, is a very important one, especially the whole idea of the transformation of social, social science. and uh, 
the theme or the topic I've chosen for my comments or to uh, put my comments under is deconstructing miseducation and false narratives, retrieving our humanity, the focus being on retrieving our humanity. Uh, so before I get directly into, present, into the presentation, I want to sort of clarify some terms in my title. First of all, deconstruction. Uh, that word is used in a lot of different ways by a lot of different people. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And for decades, there's been some tension between deconstructionists and critical theories. And that tension has revolved around the fact that um, there are certain deconstructionists who are so busy deconstructing that they deconstruct away everything. Uh, it's almost a dismantling of everything, even the concept of justice. And if you're a critical theorist and you're concerned about justice, fairness, um, you got to have those concepts and you've got to work in a particular way. So when I use the term deconstruction, it's not in that uh, very aggressive sense that a lot of people use it, where you uh, 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 dismantle everything. Uh, I use it in the sense of um, dismantling false narratives or dismantling facades, um, dismantling ideas, concepts, mechanisms that are designed to hide a particular reality, right? Um, dismantling reification, dismantling com commodity fetish, so on and so forth. So it kind of peeling away so that one can see what is actually there and get, getting beyond the facade. Um, miseducation and false narrative. Well, I always tell my students um, that when we are going through the process of educating ourselves, we always have to ask ourselves what is missing and why is it missing? When you take a history course, what is missing and why is it missing? And who benefits from that particular part of history uh, being left out? What is education designed to do? What is this function? Uh, what kind of narrative is our educational system embedded in? What kind of story is being told when we undergo the process of educating ourselves. And one has to ask that whether one is doing history, philosophy, uh, natural science, or social sciences. What is the mission of this form of education? What is it designed to do? What is the function of this form of education? And so in this context, I want to raise the question of what is the function of the social sciences? And given the title of the colloquium, um, the transformation of the social sciences suggests that we're trying to transition from one function of the social sciences to another function of the social sciences, right? And so I think with all of that, I, I clarified my, my title and I wanna jump into things. So I began with a reflection on a couple of experiences I had. Um, over 30 years ago, a friend of mine asked me, what is the point of doing philosophy? Especially in a time when we've made so many advances uh, in science and in technology. What is the point of doing philosophy? About 20 years ago, I was teaching a class in moral philosophy and a student at the point of doing moral philosophy and ethics. We've made so many developments technologically, um, so many developments in science. Uh, what is the point? And to my student, I said, well, we've made advance, advances in science and technology, but the problem is science and technology cannot tell us what to do with it. It, can, it cannot tell us uh, what is the proper application of technology. And to my friend, um, my response was that our technological development does not necessarily reflect moral progress, nor does it reflect a decrease in forms of alienation and, explanation and exploitation that destroys individuals and communities. There's still questions to be raised that require an answer well beyond the scope of science and technology. So I want to put on the table uh, uh, a quote by Socrates or a statement or claim from Socrates where he raises the question, uh, what does it mean to be human? And as a human being, what must I do? The first being an anthropological question, what does it mean to be human? And the second being an ethical question as a human being, um, what should I do? And it's important to put that question on the table because as we are developing our science or, or, or scientific knowledge, the question is in the midst of all of this, where is the human? 
the previous speaker made a comment uh, that fits in here when she said, what are humans good for? And I also want to go back to um, Andy's quote from Emily Dickinson, the question of, of nobodiness. Right? And in a capitalist system, I think it is the case that capitalism is designed to produce a sense of nobodiness. That under the capitalist system, the human being becomes a nobody. And instead of becoming a human being, the human being becomes a, a function or the way Marx puts it, an economic category. And the question now is to what degree has the social, science, social sciences been influenced by this particular disposition or this particular kind of narrative that reduces the human being to a function, uh, economic category, or a mere fact among other facts. Right? And so this is part of the problem that Marx was struggling with uh, when he developed historical materialism. Uh, his, his notion of historical materialism was, a, it was an attempt to sort of analyze the process of dehumanization and alienation, exploitation under the capitalist system. And the purpose of this was for liberation, to, to liberate, to, to sort of retrieve the human essence. And now, by human essence, Marx didn't mean anything like a fixed kind of essence, something that was static, but he meant something more like potential. So you see the word used in the writings of Marx and Marcuse of both, um, human essence, uh, where they're referring to human potential. When I'm teaching this stuff to my students, um, they, they have sort of a problem with this notion of human essence, and, and they sort of challenge it in the way that deconstructionists would. Um, and they also challenge notions of justice, who defines justice, what is justice. And I approach this in kind of a negative way via negation. And I ask them, well, let me ask you this. Um, is it the function of the human being to eat out of a garbage can? Is it the function of a human being after he or she gets their paycheck to have to sit and decide whether they're gonna pay the rent, uh, the light bill, the medical bill, or the mortgage, right? Millions and millions and millions of human, be human beings live in that kind of situation. And I could go on down the list of these kinds of questions that is this a function of the human being as you see it? And they have to say no, because if they say yes to that, then well, they deserve to eat out of a garbage can like many of the homeless people out there eating out of garbage cans. Right? And so I move from there to get them to sort of think about what does it mean to you then if that's not the case, if that, that, that doesn't, uh, the deficit of humanity doesn't include uh, that way of living, what does it mean to you? And we move then to some type of financial security, some type of well-being, um, some type of mutual respect, uh, some type of, of, of some form of happiness, and so on and so forth, right? Um, and so this, then we work in the idea that we can follow Marx here, that there's something that uh, has been lost that we need to retrieve. Now, from here, I want to actually get into the Franklin School for just a moment and talk about the relationship between uh, philosophy and the social sciences. And there are two different things here. One is when Horkheimer was uh, sort of laying out the program of critical theory, he envisioned a relationship between philosophy and uh, the social sciences, where the social sciences would discover the facts of human social existence, and philosophy would interpret those facts. Right? And that's good and well. I, I, I appreciate that. But I want to take, I think Makuza takes it a step further um, in texts like Philosophy and Critical Theory and his second book on Hegel, Reason and Revolution, where when you read those texts, philosophy actually evolves into social theory, right? Um, because he begins, say, for example, in, in Reason and Revolution, he begins talking about the German obsession or the obsession by German philosophers with the concept of freedom. And, and, and that uh, abstract notion of freedom leads to an analysis that brings us down to a more concrete understanding of freedom and the impediments to freedom, which makes social theory 
necessary. So I think Mukuza gives us a better understanding. Actually, uh, he's more Marxian in this sense than, than Horkheimer to the extent that Marx himself uh, argues that the pur purpose of philosophy is to make itself unnecessary. Right? Um, that is to bring about a certain kind of social transformation that philosophy is no longer necessary. So um, in, in, thinking about the previous speaker and the question of philosophy, is philosophy dead? Um, I, I would have to say philosophy is not dead, but maybe it should be, right? And maybe it would be once we arrived at that particular point that Makuza was talking about, right? Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Makuza and his, 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 his relationship to science, natural sciences, and even the social sciences. Um, I've been reading a book, the new book by Andrew Feinberg um, on Makuza called The Ruthless Critique of Everything Existing. And I think he does a very good job in, in discussing this problem of, of nature um, and science in Marx and Makuza both. And he claims that Marx, in, in Marx, there's a kind of uh, dual understanding of nature that's problematic. Uh, that leads to certain kinds of dilemmas. For on one hand, um, it is nature is this kind of uh, independent system, independent from human beings. On the other hand, there's a relationship where what nature is gets determined by human the human interaction with nature. And what Feinberg does is shows how um, shows how Macuza draws from phenomenology. Uh, and neo-Kantianism to deal with that particular kind of problem. And what you get is then two different understandings of nature. One is the nature of the, of the natural scientist, a kind of limited view of nature, where um, nature is this causal system that can be analyzed in terms of causal relationships, uh, facts, so on and so forth. But then the broader sense of nature, nature I, I think his, his use of Husserl's notion of the life world is very important. The broader sense of nature is uh, a kind of nature that we engage with prior to scientific inquiry. A kind of engagement that eventually gives birth to scientific inquiry, but it's prior to and makes scientific inquiry possible. So there's a kind of engagement with nature, an engagement with the world uh, as we are developing ourselves, creating ourselves, okay? And so this, in this context, nature uh, refers to a kind of meaning more so than simply facts in the natural science sense of facts, right? And this notion of life world is, is I think, is the way Makuza understands it, bringing it from Husserl and to some degree Heidegger is very important here. So we ask ourselves then, um, what is the life world context in which science develops? What is the life world context in which social science develops? And it is that life world context that gives science or social science a particular kind of mission or function, right? And we can argue that um, from a Marxian perspective, unfortunately, uh, a kind of capitalist function has been given to the social sciences, the kind of capitalist function that I think we're in the process of trying to overcome, or at least in the process of trying to uh, transform social science so that it goes beyond this very narrow um, function, a very narrow mission given to it by the social, by, by capitalism. Um, and so under capitalism, I think I've mentioned before that Humanity or human essence is lost to the extent that human beings are produced to economic categories, the laborer, the producer, the, um, the, the consumer. Uh, from time to time, I, I encounter people who try to sell me something. And as they are talking to me, giving me their spill, so I'll buy their product, they refer to me as co the consumer. And I let them know right away that that offends me, uh, that I'm not this thing called a consumer. I'm a human being that, um, happens to consume, but I'm not this thing called consumer, this category. I'm much more than that. Um, and so this sense of the human being we're trying to retrieve, uh, a sense of the human being that uh, cannot be reduced to economic categories. Um, let me let me sort of move toward a close here. Um, 
and talk about just briefly the need for intersubjective, interdisciplinary, and uh, international approach to our problem. Capitalism is, is a totality. It reaches its tentacles into all parts of the earth. Capitalism is not satisfied with restricting itself to any particular territory. It must by necessity become global. And in that sense then we all sort of share the same problem wherever we might be located on the globe. And uh, I think what we're doing here at this colloquium is essential to the extent that the only way to retrieve our humanity from what capitalism has done in terms of putting our humanity under erasure is to come together in the way that we are coming together now because the way capitalism worked, it may work in a particular way in the US, another way in Canada, a particular way in Brazil, and a particular way in India. But nevertheless, in all cases, our humanity is being put under erasure. Um, and uh, various enterprises that we've developed, such as the social sciences, are taken up as tools by the system to put humanity under erasure. And we need to envision uh, an international approach, um, an approach that uh, transforms the social sciences so that the social sciences is concerned about more than uh, facts of human existence, a social science that's concerned about uh, the human drive for happiness, community, play, reciprocity, love, and beauty. And I think this is sort of the new mission that ought to be given to the social sciences. So thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Professor Pan. You have taken uh, uh, just 15 minutes. I mean, you could have taken five more minutes more, but thank you so much for your very pointed presentation. And uh, the two points that I would like to summarize for facilitating discussion uh, in the deliberation. One is about uh, you would like to blur the boundaries between philosophy and social sciences. We are giving a very strong dose of normativity to social sciences, uh, which is very good. And uh, uh, we should all strive to uh, achieve that. But philosophers will take serious objection to this kind of blurring the boundaries. Because in uh, our case, and I make uh, this statement with a lot of care and uh, consequences, adverse consequences that, you know, uh, certain, certain trends in philosophy, doing philosophy in India have produced different kinds of vocabulary, which, which goes beyond uh, the Marxist alienation, uh, the, 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 the category of alienation. And so our paradigm shift is actually from alienation to indifference. The philosophers in this country are so indifferent to what is happening in social sciences. And they say, you should keep away from this. This is a very uh, Hegelian insinuation that, you know, we will be stigmatized if you come closer to us. Uh, so, but this is a problem, I think. And, but in the context of this, your, your, your suggestion to bridge the gap uh, between philosophy and social science is very, very welcome. Uh, so we'll discuss this uh, point that you raised uh, in, 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 in the deliberation and discussion. Uh, thank you so much once again for your presentation. Now, uh, uh, organizers, should we wait for Professor Raju Bhagav? Is he coming? What is the idea? And we can invite, if we can ask him to make presentation as and when he comes, or we, what, is the, what is the idea? Is any 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 communication with him so far? Sir, so he's coming. He's coming in next fifteen minutes. He's okay. Just so updated. can we utilize this uh, gap uh, fruitfully, creatively, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for now, uh, should we open it for discussion? Uh, yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, very insightful thoughts. And uh, uh, I think my question is very basic here, uh, which is that when we are looking at paradigm shifts within social sciences, there are also 
paradigm shifts happening and this is something which came up i think uh, during uh, professor shah menel's presentation that uh, there are also paradigm shifts happening in the way classrooms are changing nupur re yes oh yeah, yeah. Okay. i am nupur <laughs> yeah so uh, so there also paradigm shift happening in the way classroom discourse and the, the nature and the dynamics of classrooms are changing so one of the very key like as i said something very basic one of the very key points in moving with social sciences is the idea of critical engagement creative engagement is the idea of dialogue discussion it's the idea of democratic uh, you know opening up of democratic spaces and a concern and maybe others can reflect uh, you know that do you think really that there is almost like a shrinking of those democratic spaces for teachers so uh, so i have had the privilege of being taught by professor mohanty and professor gopal guru professor bhargav and i was just kind of wondering that am i able to really do that kind of uh, that kind of beautiful uh, you know enigmatic and 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 real real discourse of knowledge exchange through thesis anti thesis synthesis all of that uh, but i kind of wonder with my colleagues as we sit in the staff room uh, that there is something that is kind of missing in terms of so it's also to the so, so therefore i mean the whole idea of transforming social sciences towards also what pursuit of democratizing these spaces and especially especially classroom because i think that's where the real transformation takes place yeah thank you uh is it just a couple of more questions that i have one uh you have to ask me do you think there are also some more after 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 this yes okay please go ahead so oh go ahead go ahead please uh can I, can I raise it okay uh, yeah I, I i'm akhil ranjan dattar this is regarding the presentation by professor rupa manjari ghosh uh, she was referring to the philanthropic uh, in the context of india how is it contributing towards so they call it expanding freedom or creative freedom and for that matter competence and leadership but if you look at the india discourses india had always been very critical about the western philanthropy now because it has its relationship with the corporate we definitely agree that at the critical moment when the public has completely controlled by the state or the state has become a bit completely undemocratic and also very in exclusive in nature uh, we have a little bit of hope hope for, uh, for from the philanthropic initiative but we if we look at from the perspective of the people people as defined by the constitution and people defined in terms of you know bringing everyone together you know uh, breaking the boundaries in terms of class caste the religion and so on and so forth to what extent we can be hopeful about this philanthropic initiatives does it have also its own limits in terms of bringing about exclusion thereby trends you know you know pushing us to a sort of undemocratic practices thank you so samanthi i just want to compliment uh, the uh presenter presenters and uh, uh i have a question to all of you uh in the longer span of history do we see parad uh, paradigm shifts uh, settling down or constantly there are battles over paradigms and uh, so there are moments when you feel that a shift has taken place or uh, there are challenges to a certain paradigm but uh, you know from history that uh, you know the acclaimed paradigm will have its opposition uh, and uh, i know the that i mean in natural sciences 
probably we have been told uh, of a different story uh, and social science is a different story, but I would say that there is something common that in the long span of history, uh, systems of knowledge, systems of understanding, and knowing fully well that this, uh, uh, you know, this fact value distinction is a very artificial distinction, uh, that these paradigms also begin to be changed, begin to be challenged. So should we build into our argument and particularly all the innovations that uh, these uh, educational experiments and uh, at these centers have done, um, uh, you know, so this, that uh, you begin to see spaces where the creativity is possible. In other words, social science becomes social possibility. Uh, so, uh, how would you bring in this this element of uh, struggle over paradigms being constant in the longer span of history? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Monty. So, should we uh, request the panel to respond? Uh, one more round. Uh, okay. okay, okay. Please go ahead. Okay. Now, I have a couple of quick responses for uh, the, on the classroom discourses uh, thing. Thank you for bringing it up. In fact, because Professor Guru didn't give me enough time, so I had to, I couldn't uh, <laughs> cover that properly. <laughs> no, the thing is, um, I, I would say that um, um, if you want to make sense of the complex social reality, which we realized when we started uh, creating this MPhil program in development practice, we thought that we must start with the immersion. So it's a it's a four semester program in which more than two semesters interspersed uh, and uh, staggered over the four semesters. They actually spend in the field. The field is actually tribal areas, and these students actually are living in tribal hamlets. Um, you know, uh, which of course the, the program has to wind up to wind up because the Minister of Home Affairs was very upset about it. You know, that's a different issue, but. Uh, uh, that program, when it was there, it was actually extremely meaningful. And the, it, had a, it had an iterative process. The students would go to the field, come back, and then there was this making sense of what they saw and experienced. And that's when theory comes into the picture, you know, and then they try and see whether, juxtapose whether these, uh, these framework would fit into their experiences and so on and so forth. And this was like a, a it was iterative, two, it was grounded. It was a very grounded theorization approach. Which I think is, I'm just using one example. There can be many. The clinical uh, studies, which we, with psychosocial clinical studies, again was very, very, um, you know, the clinic based and the theory comes uh, intermittently in the sense there is a back and forth between theory and this immersion, whatever. Yeah. So that is something which uh, many people are trying, nothing very new, but that I think would be uh, a direction which we need to really look forward to. Uh, on the philanthropy thing, I want to say one thing. I mean, I'm sorry this is out of turn. But uh, see, philanthropy is nothing very new. Benares Hindu University, Vishabharati, Jamia Millia Islamia, Sagar, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, Annamale University. You name any. There are, there are, all these started with philanthropic in the initiatives. And then mm -hmm. it, the interface, the, the, the distinction between private and public was very diffuse. In fact, no university is private. Every university, by definition, is public. They are public institutions. They are legislated. They are legislated uh, under a, uh, you know, by the by a parliament or a legislature. They are public institutions. The promoters may be governments. Promoters may be private. Now, many of the look at the University of Pune. Uh, it has become very entrepreneurial in 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 the kind of courses they develop. And on the other hand, we have Azim Premji University which is very, uh, you know, they subsidize many of their courses. So my sense is that the distinction is becoming very, very diffuse. And oh, I, I, I agree with uh, uh, Professor Rupmanjari when she said that, uh, you know, that the, there, is a, there are different kinds of institutional uh, uh, designs which we need to really look forward to. I think we have, uh, we have exhausted more or less the kind of things which we have. 
and everything based on this largest coming from the state would actually be it's a bit difficult to maintain um, for autonomy particularly i think because uh, because the more more you depend completely on for money the less autonomous you are so we need to really work out a way in which i, I, I don't know how but i think uh, uh, if you give me another occasion i'll talk talk about how the fee policy of ambedkar university was and uh, we will the, the, that can be uh, another uh, occasion third about professor mohandeep thing i i do think that uh, so long as uh, you know we uh, the, there is a there is a bit of a contradiction here we are sitting on the on on a perch on a branch of a tree and then we cutting the very branch so what i am trying to say is that uh, the, when the, the moment we are in a space which is under the patronage of a certain entity and our main um, main job as social scientists is to critique that entity so this this uh, you know the, the patronage uh, contradicts and these days particularly patronage whether it is private or public you don't expect uh, uh, any any kind of um, any kind of uh, without, without an expectation of return nothing is given so uh, this 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 is a problem so i think how do we get out of institutional setup where uh, this patronage the dependence on patronage is not there icssr is a in the case in point i think we need to really understand the icssr and its uh, its dynamics the way in which it has been funding institutions the icssr dependent institutions the vulnerabilities they go through i think it's it's a it, it, we we need to understand what, what exactly we are uh, talking about in in terms of organized social researches it's here it's here hi rajiv it's here thank you how much is going to the question uh, i'm sorry I would like to respond to the question about paradigm shifts uh, in the long term. Um, I think about this in a way that, well, well, first of all, let's go back to the Marxist notion of revolution. There are Marxists who believe that the revolution is kind of a one-time event. We're going to have this big revolution. It's going to bring about total social transformation and um, this kind of end of story. I don't um, think about revolution in that way. I think the most accurate view of revolution comes from Rosa Luxemburg. uh who who talked about revolution in stages right um as you as you um engage in social transformation or paradigm shift uh one does not really have accurate knowledge of what things are going to look like after that moment and what new problems will be presented before one after that moment so for somebody like Rosa Luxemburg the revolution is an ongoing process that happens in stages and that's the way i tend to think about paradigm shifts and i think that's sort of the way thomas kuhn himself actually thought about paradigm shifts there's no one final paradigm shift but there's a series of paradigm shifts that i think will continue as long as uh humanity uh, is around so we have professor rajiv bhargav uh, but we'll uh, request professor bhargav to speak after she respond is responses to the queries that were raised on her presentation rupa all right yeah i think it has been more or less answered but i wanted to add one half a point to uh, the first one thing that you know those kind of discourses is one limit that we always found in shivnagar is size of your class when you have large classes those kind of luxuries sort of go away so we sort of you have to think of tutorials and breaking your class into groups when you have a huge number of enrollments that becomes a logistical problem but i think other than that i think we we are continuing to do that and the question that was on philanthropy mostly directed uh, to what i said i think it has been answered very nicely by sham but i would also add one thing that you know india needs many models and uh, i'm not preaching for one not none of us are actually doing is one model that works the one point that is important it is not important for me who writes the check whether it's coming from the taxpayers money or it's some private person donating that there is a arms length clause in all of these for example shivnagar became an institute of eminence so i had to sign that mou and there is a lot of things about inbuilt in that to keep your funders at arms length and i think it has all the right intentions 
practicality, you still have to see. But when these kind of interferences are actually going to scuttle what you're talking about. So both public and private, we have seen the same thing. It doesn't matter who writes the check, keep that thing at arm's length, give autonomy to the university is the model that would take care of all of that. And I agree with uh, the last answer given to President Monty's very uh, deep question. We worry about that a lot, but I think it's almost human. As long as I'm thinking, I'll keep on rediscovering myself, destroying myself in the process. So I think that's what collectively also we are doing. And paradigm shift is when you actually see internal dis internal kind of discrepancies emerging in a discipline, which happens when you have uh, pushed it to uh, one particular limit, then another frontier sort of opens up through this kind of revolution, which uh, I agree that it happens in stages. So it's been really, really nice. So thank you very much. Yeah. Really waiting for Rajiv. Uh, thank you very much. Those who want to really, I mean, uh, 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 exceed without causing a lot of interruptions, and they are they are allowed to exit. Yeah. Ah, if you want to stay back, you can stay back. Otherwise, uh, 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 no, but I am being just rational so that you know we hear and tell. So, uh, uh, Professor Raju Bhargav, we have already introduced you to the. August, August God gathering, and I also introduced you in a different way. So, do you want me to introduce you again? Okay, so may I invite you uh, to make a presentation? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm terribly sorry uh, that I'm late and I haven't heard all the previous speakers. So, I feel a bit of an imposter. I don't know. You know what has happened before, and uh, you know what I have to say will be of any relevance uh, to 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 uh, to all of you. Uh, I was uh, I told Savita and uh, others who had contacted me that I have a lecture today, and that lecture lasted three hours uh, from two thirty to five thirty, and so I, it was in Okla, and I had to get back and then come here. So. Uh, this was something which was I had already committed to before I agreed to uh, to come here. So there was no way that I could have uh, I could have uh, uh, been here at five o'clock when the whole thing started. So I I just have some very elementary uh, remarks to make. I'm sure everybody has already covered these. Uh, so uh, forgive me for any repetitions. Uh, but uh, just uh, sort of paying uh, some attention to the two terms that we are uh, that are foregrounded uh, here: uh, relationality and plurality, or plural pluralism, really. Uh, so the relationality I see as something that exists in the in an ontological. Sort of field, uh, uh, and uh, it's it's part of what we might call uh, uh, the questions that we raise about the nature of how the world is, how uh, you know what exists, uh, or what or what human beings are, uh, how they relate to the world, and so on. So it's it's something to do with with simply answering questions such as what is uh, what is what is it that we are really talking about when we're talking about human beings and so on. I, I'd like to make, I'd say of course that human beings are uh, relational creatures. So relationality is something which is absolutely fundamental to the very nature of human beings, to what human beings are. But I'd like to make a distinction between what we might call manifest relationality and uh, something which, for lack of a better word, word I call deeper uh, relationality. And human beings are not just manifestly relational. So uh, an example of manifest relationality would be something like, you know, here I am talking to all of you or discussing something with all of you, and so we are interacting and there is a some kind of a relation which has been formed as a result of this interaction. And uh, that is an obvious thing. I mean, 
but we but it's still to be distinguished from what we might call an aggregate uh, just a crowd when people get into a get onto a bus uh, they they may you may just be standing there and there is no re relation with anybody uh, there is no relationality established and uh, and that is so so uh, there is not even a manifest relationality and so an aggregate and manifest relationality is one sort of uh, thing and human beings of course or, or always interdependent interrelational something like that is there but i think human beings are relational in a much more in a deeper sense it's not just that they are in manifest uh, relationships with one another that they form groups and associations and so on uh they are you can you can say something to the effect that they are always already in some relationship to the other so even when they are standing as as individuals uh there's already in a sense some relationality which is embedded in every individual because to move from being a physical uh, body to humanity that transition is not possible without already there being something like a deep relationality we're always already that there are layers and layers of uh, social sociality um, and uh, which are already generative of what we call human beings uh there is these are these these relations are very dense multi layered there is a uh, sedimented uh, they're historically sedimented uh so that we are as we are born without with the minimal sort of relationality manifest relationality with others we are already in a web of a social relation which pre-exists us from a much you know what period much longer back and uh, so so relationality has to be understood in this deeper sense as constitutive of human beings and this is the old you know uh, you can say it's the marxist thesis is a hegelian thesis uh, that you know the social being prior to individual consciousness so so in fundamental sense we are social and social is 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 is, is uh, we are we are relational uh, in a in a very deep sense so so uh, so that is something that we simply that's what we are even when we are in our, our innermost solitude when we say we are praying in relation and and worshiping something mm -hmm. uh, this is something which is impossible without a whole web of social practices uh, which have already generated something called prayer there is a linguistic mediation there is a symbolic express mediation and it is this mediation which has to be already uh, taken into account before we start talking about anything which is human so this deep relationality is something which is extremely important now this relationality can uh can be a, of any of diff very different kinds and that produces um, different kinds of human beings uh, it produces diversity it uh, it um, it produces uh, uh, different kinds of historicities uh, that's all something which we might say is is really uh, uh, again something which can be spelled out when we are talking about relational human beings uh uh but we also have this capacity not only to uh, be uh, in the world in this deeply relational world we also have the capacity of what we might call transcendence uh and uh this transcendence means that you can step back and look beyond and and look at the whole situation the whole world as it exists and somehow figure out this make this capacity we may have developed much later but we can step back and look beyond and see what the limitations are in this world and uh, as you exam you you can then aspire you can understand that there is a big gap that exists 
between how things are and how things at their best can be. So uh, and the moment you start realizing, you know, when you have this vision of this is how things are, but this is how they can be, and we have to reduce the gap, there's already something like a normative vision that is entering into the picture. You know, how, think, how can we be at our best? How can things be much better than they are now? How do, and what steps we need to take in order to move from how we are to what at best we can be? And this is where this idea of transformation comes in, which cannot be dealing from, uh, from a normative vision of certain kind. So, uh, uh, so the whole issue of, of uh, I mean, if we were creatures who could just accept things as they are, uh, we would be uh, very different uh, from what we really are. We are creatures who are constantly uh, disaffected, dissatisfied. We're not, uh, we are discontented. And the reason for the discontent is because we have an aspiration to be different from what we are, and we therefore have some sort of vision of the trans of some idea of transcendence. And uh, and uh, that brings us to pluralism, uh, because uh, which is a normative concept, uh, diversity, and uh, uh, which is uh, uh, part of our. Uh, which, which I mentioned is something which is to do with the mere fact of uh, how different kinds of relationalities produce differences of different kinds, which are simply there, right? But uh, when we, we have to take a stand uh, at some point of time, uh, either to accept things as they are or to make, you know, some effort to bring about a change, you know, to realize a better world. And then we have to uh, see whether to accept this diversity or whether to to transcend this diversity. And uh, this transcendence can be, I think, uh, of. Uh, I mean, there be there, there are two views on that. One is that we can produce one world which is which is common to all of us and which is in a sense uniform. Uh, and uh, I think that's a completely crazy idea. That we can actually transcend this world uh, and you know somehow overcome diversity and produce some uniformity. Uh, on the contrary, I think we must realize that there is no way that we can live uh, uh, in a world where uh, one person, one group, one culture, one large section of humanity can generate or create all that is a part of a, a good, flourishing individual or collective human life, that's simply impossible. So, so uh, if we accept that, then we have to not only accept this diversity reluctantly, but we have to celebrate. And that celebration of diversity is something which is intended to what we might call pluralism. So pluralism is that some, at a slightly different level, which comes with normativity, comes with certain ethics, uh, ethical visions, uh, and uh, and and it's linked to. So my sort of the basic claim is that uh, in our understanding and explain, explanation of the world, we've got to have some uh, recognition of diversity, but in a transformative uh, agenda that we have. Uh, we've got to not only accept the diversity reluctantly, but also realize that human, partly for human limitations, but partly because of the nature of the, the immense diversity that we have, and the impossibility of any one group or one culture or one section of humanity to realize all that is good. We've got to realize that whatever good life that we want to lead is something that is not possible without different people contributing their own little bits to it, and therefore the celebration of diversity and celebration uh, of uh, immense uh, uh, different recognizing of difference of something is absolutely crucial to a pluralist world. And transformative social science, therefore, or trans, you know, trans is, is, uh, is, is uh, 
is 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 impossible without without uh, pluralism. Uh, in in my view, it has to recognize that. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah. So, Raju, I was actually frantically asking the organizers to contact you. And uh, I was about to reprimand them, the please contact him. The reason was this. And I was actually debating with Vitusha and Dhananjay. What, what do you mean by relationality? And the note they have submitted, uh, they have made some points, but I wasn't very clear about it. But thanks for throwing some light on this. Uh, and that's why the, my franticness has actually had some moral significance at the moment. Now, two points, and I, we can discuss this very important uh, presentation that uh, Professor Bhargav has made. And the difference between the, 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 the manif manifest or aggregated rationality and deep rationality. What is this? What is happening to me? Deep uh, relationality and aggregated and manifest relationality. And he has brought out very clearly the difference between the two. Uh, let me, for the sake of uh, the students and my own clarification, that uh, manifest relationality can be understood in terms of the concept of indifference, I mean, made a mention to this in earlier presentation. For example, uh, I, I am uh, manifestly relational uh, to you in the sense that I may, I, I, I'm, I can take this position that you exist or you don't exist for me in politics, culture, uh, <laughs> doing theory, producing knowledge. It doesn't matter. And if you matter, then I can rationally help you doing choosing what, what you should do, what course you should do, what what thesis you should write, what what theme you should choose for your dissertation. But in 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 the extreme sense, I may not bother about it. You take any whatever you want to take. Indifferent. I'm completely uh, and and regressively indifferent to your well-being, so to say. So indifference is one component that can actually uh, define this manifest uh, or aggregated rationality. In the ra in the uh, rational sense, uh, uh, in the rational sense, the element of aggregation actually is at play, but not in the completely indifferent ways. ways. So this is one uh, uh, one submission to your consideration. The deeper one actually, you uh, gave us a lot of scope. To make some theoretical conceptual moves. One small move I will make is that you no, know, what is the content of this deeper rationality? What is the diversity you very rightly said? And, and every group has to contribute to this overall good, not one uh, single uh, idea of good work in the in the in the framework of uh, plurality. And Savita ji, you know, you will remember, I will give that metaphor of Bhagura Bhagul, a Marathi, very legendary literature. There's a, there's a termite hill, and there are several holes in that hill. Now, your plurality model is actually representing that termite hill with many holes. And many holes are promising good. But there are people who are trying to close all the surrounding holes and maintain only one hole. And it can be Marxism, Gandhism, whatever. I'm just taking few names. Either. So that uh, uh, is one way of looking at it. You know, do you want to close holes or you want to actually allow? So that's a deeper way of uh, relating yourself to others. And if I'm a liberal uh, person, then I'll say the notion of being fair and unfair will also matter in this deeper rationality. So where you you actually are always on the tender hook to define yourself constantly in terms of the transcendence you're achieving, stepping back and looking beyond. And you require a kind of a mirror to look back to yourself, one to one. In, the, in front of the mirror, one is looking at on to oneself. There's no other. So that's, I think, deeper ways of being uh, relating to oneself and to others, interrogating oneself all the time. 
I don't know. I mean, I'm just submitting to your concern. Uh, sorry for this arrogance because you are. Uh, thank you. Yes, May I ask? Not, now we can add. This way. This, uh, Raji. Well, I made all the pro, uh, points. <laughs> <laughs> I just have a question, not a question, just an inquiry, basically, uh, emanating from uh, Rajiv's presentation. So wonderful by saying that our deeper, deeper relationships basically remain most of the times unmanifest. But they are there, that is to say, their ontological status is confirmed. On that basis, that I mean, this is Roy Pascoe, basically. All right. So, for example, he makes a statement saying that our manifest lives are full of miseries, are based on the promise of uh, love and freedom. That basically constitute our unmanifest uh, relationships that we have with ourselves and with nature and with other people. Meaning to say that a lot of uh, misery is, a lot of freedom basically is uh, supported by a lot of misery. It's class society basically. So uh, just before you came, Professor Arnold Farr also made you almost a similar point by saying that that the problem that has uh, that is quite apparent in capitalist mode of production is that human beings have been reduced to just a unit of labor. They are in the process. Just they are basically a process, not so much uh, are, uh, are connected in any relationality, even manifest. The only relationship they have is uh, with the capital, which reduces them all the time, continuously, either as consumers or as a unit of labor. That is why this alienated life, this relationship, this, this is formed within this mode of production, is alienated. An unalienated life is something that is hoped for. That's where liberation theories come, liberation contemplation comes and all that. Will you have, since you have studied with Charles Taylor, it's from that perspective I'm asking, will you be able to say something about this unmanifest uh, relationships that human beings have with themselves, with others? I mean, a lot of re religion, for example, I, I'm sure Charles Taylor went into doing a lot of work on world religion and religions and notions of the self and so on and so forth. You know, a lot of students are here. They would very much like to know how is that this other possibility of us emerging as also spiritual beings? Will that spirituality uh, impossible to talk about because it is uh, still un unmanifest, still in a in quiet form? Uh, yes. Thank you. So, first question, of course, is to Rajiv. And uh, uh, I think uh, one of the problems that one would like to know about is, of course, we are a relational being. And I think the relational being defines our species being, of course. But why are we not able to realize that? What is the problem in that? Where is the hindrance? A capitalism could be one. Uh, are there more things? Is there something innate in human nature that makes us also non relational being at times? And how does that interplay take place? Uh, also, that what kind of social science have we been doing? Uh, I want your reflection on that. Uh, I'll take uh, your case, actually, the secularism debate. So have we not till now mostly concentrated on uh, state-centric social science? How do the state behave? How the state should behave? And we could not really create a social science which could reconceptualize our uh, relationships uh, beyond the uh, limits of a state relationship. And uh, the question that Pavita raised, uh, uh, the secularism debate did not really uh, bring in 
the importance of our spiritual being, the transcendence that you talked about. So do we need to really uh, take our social science debate beyond this state-centric sphere and do something more than that? Uh, also because, you know, uh, I have a feeling that social science is quite alienated from society. It's no more feeling, it's a concrete situation actually. We keep writing on secularism, people remain communal, communal or became more communal. So what is lacking there that we are not really playing enough transformative, uh, 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 we don't have enough tra transformative effect. Whereas, and also why have we really ignored the Indian thinkers uh, during the freedom struggle who are not supposed to be social scientists within court, but they were actually social scientists, but they were doing transformative politics and without solid understanding of society, they could not have been able to mobilize people and galvanize so much of uh, uh, things. So is there something lacking in the model of social science that we are doing? Is the model basically guided by uh, the university structure, which is actually the state-sponsored structure? So that is one. Second uh, to Professor Rukmanjari Ghosh, I remember when you became vice chancellor, I asked you this question. Do you think uh, uh, Srinagar is the next generation of university in India? And you replied very nicely saying that, well, I can only imagine a, a, a possibility, but not sure, as it happened with Times of India and Hindustan Times. The founders were having big imagination, then finally that they became tabloids. So uh, what is the possibility of these universities? The kind of uh, hope that it generated, that it might create a new kind of social science where there's a lot of freedom. Do you see that freedom there or even that will become a state capital relationship guided by state capital relationship? And finally, the signs are very much visible that uh, the professors are told what you should write and what you should not write. In fact, some of the professors are used as advertisement symbols when they are posted on the, on the website saying that we'll come to this university, join here. So as if they're advertising, I can, can never imagine uh, such a thing from uh, a public university. So where is, where is the possibility lies in social sciences in India? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So, I mean, you come from uh, theoretical physics, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and you did mention about transdisciplinarity. So, my question is that when it comes to engagement of transdisciplinarity, a uh, transdiscipline, transdisciplinary nature, uh, do you think that there is lies an obstacle when it comes to engagement between social science and natural science when it comes to the question of methodology and ontology also? For instance, we have seen things like social affairs and social, uh, natural scientists have become really cautious after social affairs and they started treating all social theory with a postmodernist lens and being skeptical of postmodernism without knowing what postmodernism post is all about. So, I mean, the question is that, is it a methodological barrier or is it something ontological in nature, which is like the primary ontological debate between physical and social ontology? So, yeah, and my uh, small question to Professor Bhargava. I mean, uh, you did mention about the difference between, um, if I'm not wrong, deep relationality and the manifest. Can we say that deep relationality is affective in nature? It primarily deals with emotions and also affective in the way they use in these people interpret affect as bodies engaging it with other bodies in that sense. And the manifest relationality is, I mean, as you pointed out, is about indifference. So it lacks an affective component to it. Thank you. Yes, 
Thank you so much. So uh, I am Aparna. So I have a question uh, from Gopal Guru, Professor Gopal Guru. Um, Sorry, sir. So it's a very important question. So basically, you have made two points. One in uh, in India, in Indian context, we are moving towards uh, we are moving from alienation to indifference, which also means lack of empathy. The second point that you have made, creativity is a better way to start with. Though it is, uh, I mean, do, it is also under. Uh, criticism in many ways. So, on the basis of uh, this second point that you have made, and there is very good work by Chandra uh, Mohanty. Uh, uh, the book is basically Third World Women and Politics of Feminism, wherein she is quoting a poem by uh, Cherry L. West. The poem is about I ain't the right kind of feminist. So, in a way, so what uh, my point is basically, she is first criticizing her position when she are when she is looking towards third world uh, uh, feminism. So, on the basis of this background, my question is this: If we look at Indian social science discourse, do you think there is a complete paradigm shift, or we are still experiencing a kind of transgression? Because when we say relationality, it also means we are locating self in a very critical manner when we say deep relationality. So yeah, that, thank you. Uh, this is a query to Professor Rupananjari Ghosh. Um, two issues are very important in, co in connection with the social sciences in private universities. One is depoliticization and homogenization and, uh, and the politically correct social sciences have become a new norm in many universities and for example you don't have many universities don't have political science department but have public policy departments many universities won't have uh, constitutional departments but ethical departments so uh, uh, then how do we envisage social sciences because once you have this burden being politically correct, either you can be politically correct or you can do social sciences, both can, can't go together. How do you see the future of social sciences in private university in this manner? Uh, to Professor Rajiv Vargo, I like this division. So this deep personality is a priori or does it have temporality as well? I mean, in that sense. Yeah, good evening. I'm Malik Arjun from IIT. Uh, I have uh, two questions. First to Professor um, Far. Uh, I just wanted to know, you know, like from your reading of Marx, and since we have been speaking today, we spoke of um, science and technology and, and sort of sort of this um, unimpeded growth of it. Uh, how do you reflect on this work by uh, Bastani, you know, uh, uh, on fully automated luxury communism? which also wants to um, incorporate sort of automation towards uh, uh, in its uh, left narrative. So how do you reflect on it from your reading of Marx? Uh, second uh, question for Professor Bhagav is, uh, uh, you rightly mentioned, you know, like the now the problem is between imposing a common um, um, sort of a criteria to rein in the chaos of difference. And uh, so now, in absence of this, I would ask, what are what is the criteria, or how do we negotiate differences? You know, like on what basis? On what basis do we intervene so that we don't slide into relativism? Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. This mic, mic. Yeah. Uh, can I pretend to look at? Uh, yeah, please go ahead. My question is to Professor Bhargava, and I'm sorry if it seems like more categorical kind of question and also a repetition of what Manindra sir already asked. Uh, would not diversity be a prior category which is recognized in relationality? And since both have an ontological basis, pluralism seems to present a default kind of a normative. Uh, what could explain any deviance from that? Last question, sir. Uh, what would you see as a difference between pluralism and relativism uh, when thinking about social sciences? Because relativism is also a recurrent theme that keeps coming up to debunk pluralism in a way. So that's it. Thank you.
uh, uh, one question to uh, uh, Professor Ghosh. Uh, in your talk, you at several times you meant you know uh, Supriya. Supriya. Okay. Sorry. Yes, Supriya. I'm a PhD candidate at CPS, GNU. So you time and again mentioned about excellence that drives higher education. That should be the goal. I think some of the debates that took place, that has taken place in political theory and otherwise when mill centrally that excellence or creativity uh, excellence or creativity uh, i mean this, this this the central thing that drives that is freedom i mean academic freedom but that is something that is least talked about when we talk about private universities in india when I mean, especially uh, you know the question that dhananjay sir asked that whenever we talk about social science in particular academic freedom takes a back seat the second is you talk about whether you take funds from state or you know whether it comes from it doesn't matter i mean does it really don't matter from where the funds come can we write if say certain organizations fund certain research can we write against that organization is there a degree of freedom here to 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 go against that so does it not matter the, the second question to professor bhargava and it's a very short and not very intelligent question, but I just want to know, you know what are the limits of pluralism in a sense that we are entering into a world where climate crisis and artificial intelligence will be the big two things that we need to worry about as collectively as a human race. So, and, and when diversity or pluralism defines us as what human beings are, we have different perspectives on each of those things. So, how how do you think in a world going into uh, a crisis, how do, how do we negotiate on such bigger issues across the world? How do we negotiate? So, so is there a limit to pluralism? How do we think about social regulation on these two big issues? That is. So we will go back to the panelists and we will start with Professor Far. Can you hear me? There was a question uh, for you. Yes. Uh, you could, okay, please go ahead. So the question regarding automation um, from a Marxist perspective, I mean, on one, one hand, um, Marx celebrated that type of development because for him it would make labor easier and we could produce more faster and that would make more time for leisure. Uh, but at the same time, he was aware of the fact that uh, automation and technology might not be used that way. And we can see that that um, actually uh, automation and technology is being used in such a way that um, uh, machines are actually replacing people. Um, when I go to the grocery stores, I refuse to use the self checkout uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it's putting people out of work, and two is forcing me to engage in labor without pay that other people will be engaged in. Um, so yeah, capitalism has used automation in a way that supports capitalism and not workers or individuals. Sure. Uh, yeah, Professor Ghosh. Yeah, uh, lots of very, very interesting questions. I can't claim to have the last answer, but I'll give you my very honest feedback on this. When I talked about even uh, excellence and uh, academic freedom that go with it, you would notice that I've been harping on the word leadership a lot. This is not my normal speech. I mean, I've been feeling the problem of this because, you know, uh, we are talking about building uh, institutions in which you would allow for that. And I joked about it, you know, how much freedom you need to do. So a lot depends on the leadership. What are the priorities of the institution that you cannot dictate from outside? And this is true the criticism not just, I'm sorry, not of private institutions alone. This happens in public places pretty much, particularly today if you look at it. That's what I was saying. And this would partly answer on Indra, but I would need a session with him to tell him the full story privately. But, uh, but it partly answers that question as well. So I think what I'm talking about is kind of an ideal situation where who writes the check does not matter. That was my statement, as long as you have that arm's length concept working, it doesn't work. I mean, if you have the chancellor who is part of the funding 
family, then also there could be. But most people, as I so my argument was based on that there is nothing at stake in philanthropy of that kind where there is no profit mo motive. There is absolutely no profit motive. So therefore, yes, and uh, partly to you, I'll just come to that. That is a complicated one. But so the only motivation, only motive is creating a legacy which can happen only by excellence. So if you do not give that freedom, the excellence doesn't come. Therefore, you defeat the purpose you set it up with. If you're not making money out of it, why else are you setting up a university? So I think this is the leadership job to make this point clear again and again and again. And there's a lot of freedom. You know, it's a human tendency to every time there is a barrier put, you try to cross it, right? I mean, I try to restrain you and you would actually break it. The best barriers are the once barriers, if you call them. When you collectively come up with certain codes, saying that not forever, but when I'm this young, certain risks I'm not going to take, for example. That's totally internal. Nobody else's business, really, I would say. Internal academicians to decide on it, to implement and do whatever they want to do. So I, I see a lot of space actually there, which is not being utilized. And leadership is the point. And I think leadership's job is also to keep that arm's length, uh, you know, uh, that your interest should be the same interest. It's just that we don't speak the same language. I come to your question immediately. I hope I have an answered that. It's a language problem mostly, not so much uh, the, the system of inquiry that you use in the two. I am not very competent to talk about in depth about social sciences, though I had Sujata and Avajit Pathak as good friends. Uh, for years and you know somebody is sitting next to me now but i am not competent to talk about every method from my limited experience what i've seen is mostly a question of not understanding each other's language we simply do not understand if i start giving your physics lecture today i when i do not understand enough i take shelter behind te technical language that means i have not understood it well i can't use plain english it's the same thing about social science as well. Only when I sit with one Indra and talk one on one, he's talking plain English, I understand perfectly well. So we need to sort of interact more. And I think that is something that we need to do. The reason I mentioned, I gave only two examples, I have many, of questions where it's necessary, it's by design you have to involve scientists and social scientists together. If you find a common goal, it becomes easier. Through those interactions, we have been able to create, for example, in Shibrada, I don't know how long it would last, but we have been able to create this uh, an atmosphere where we talk to each other freely. I'll give you one example. The entire uh, you know, Department of International Relations, when you are dealing with problems, again, not my domain, but you know, there are many things that happened when I was there. So international relations, the moment you understand the what is the real issue about Tibet, is it the land? It's no, it's something else. It's the water probably, right? So the moment you understand that technology, international relations, all of these things and understanding of science the way we do, sort of come together. But we don't talk to each other. We don't even share this. That actually I know how, what you're talking about. And the other person saying, actually, this is the problem that we are dealing with and this is how we solve. So I think you start with problems that force you to talk to each other, learn each other's methodology, and we can only improve. Science is not foolproof either, right? Paradigm shifts are happening continuously. Uh, and, uh, you know, I may not call it paradigm shift. I prefer to call it, a, I mean, okay, uh, that's another debate. But this is happening in both this and in all, in all domains of human, this thing. It's our human tendency to push the edge uh, to its limit and break it and then discover something new. So I think that's the way forward. Uh, more interactions, it cannot be just because morally it's the right thing to do. You know, human beings need some incentives. Students need some incentives. I give them a very practical problem. It excites them because then they need to talk to an IR person and me together to actually even formulate the problem. And most of the problem is solved when you can actually formulate, uh, formulate it. So I think this is happening now. And my best bet to answer your question in full is the young people. They don't have the inhibitions that I had. I never studied biology. I regretted it. I hated it actually in school. 
So I regret it now that I never learned it. So I learned it when I became an adult, but it's never the full thing. Similarly, so even within sciences, there's so many things we don't know. We don't talk to each other. We don't understand each other's language. So I think if you look at it, this transdisciplinarity would actually mean when I've been able to sort of transcend all these borders and actually come to that kind of an education. That's the dream. And I think that's the future for our youth. That's really the future. Thank you. Sure. Yes, please. Thank you, uh, uh, Gopal, Sabita, uh, Manendra, and a whole lot of other people whose names I couldn't, can't remember uh, for all the questions, all the very interesting and relevant questions that you raised. I possibly cannot answer all, uh, but I have three uh, uh, broad sort of questions uh, which I still remember and to which I try and uh, give some kind of a answer. First of all, uh, on this question of pluralism and relativism, uh, if we, I think uh, uh, both in our ethical and moral life and in our cognitive uh, endeavors and our cognitive life, we face this question of truth. Uh, and I feel that uh, to the answer, you know, is there a, is there a truth or the matter in both, uh, we can have at least three, uh, uh, I mean, to this question, uh, we can have three answers. One is, there's only one truth. And perhaps there are some, some uh, questions in specific areas uh, of even ethical life and moral life, as well as in our cognitive life, where you could possibly say that there's only one true answer. Uh, the second option is to say that there isn't one, but there are many true answers. Uh, and that is what I think is pluralism, uh, both in cognitive and in our moral and ethical life. And obviously, when I say I don't want to contrast these two because the cognitive element is always present in the moral and ethical one as well. So <clears throat> it's for just our sake of convenience that I'm saying this. But pluralism is, uh, uh, there is no one true answer. There are many true answers. And, uh, and there are some questions to which there isn't really an answer. At least as of now, we don't really have an answer. All of these presuppose the, 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 the difference between true and false, or some degree of, you know, it's not doesn't have to be absolutely true and absolutely false, but some distinction between what we might call true. Relativism is, 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 uh, is, is, is the idea that there isn't a true answer. I mean, the very idea, the very question of true and false is wrong. Everything is okay in both moral life, ethical life, and in cognitive life. Anything goes is what, you know, certain kind of relativism, as I understand it, that's what it says. So the so I'm happy. Maybe there are some domains when anything goes. I mean, that is an empirical issue. But as far as I can tell, these are the three uh, answers that I would like to explore. One, many, and in ethical and moral life, certainly, and on all cognitive issues related to our human and ethical and moral life, I would say that there are plural answers. True, all true. Not in, you know, not a range of you know, maybe limited, but true answers. Uh, so uh, that should, uh, you know, to the best possible, you know, that question you raised or somebody, somebody else, okay. The second is uh, this manifest relationality and deep relationality. Uh, I think, uh, see, when we, when we, uh, in manifest, uh, relationality, you may find that people are indifferent, or people have uh, 
have a a, have a, 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 a people are instrumental towards each other or uh, so it's not but they could also be loving to each other uh, all of this is possible but the deeper relationality issue is what are the deeper social conditions under which uh, or uh, because of which uh, people are in it or they are instrumental or they 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 have a they have deep bonds of friendship or they love each other and so you know, what are the broader social matrix or the broader social practices so i mean atomism uh, is it seems to be you know people are living in isolated individuals they're interacting instrumentally with one another they have only external relations and these are fragile and they break down and so on but there is a deeper uh, set of social practices which we must explore which is responsible for these manifest relations atomism is not something which is a natural feature it's something which is uh, born out of a deeper social matrix. Uh, I mean, so capitalism is a so is a set of social practices, and uh, and that is what is producing perhaps uh, indifference or atomism or instrumental rationality or whatever it is. So, so I mean the. Uh, so I think uh, uh, it's that's that's what I meant when I said that there are there are deeper relations. I mean there are. I mean, here ethics comes in bad, good, and so on. But there are horrendously invisible and and horrendous and invisible uh, and obscure and hidden. Deliberate, sometimes deliberately, sometimes simply because they've slipped into the background and people don't recognize them. Bad social practices, which are responsible for a whole lot of nasty things which are happening in society. Sometimes when people are, you know, seemingly, you know, they're very good and loving and moral, they they hidden underneath. I mean, you can see that they can very easily break down. There is a, they're fragile, and the reason for that is the underground, the underlying uh, social uh, 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 practices. They themselves are utterly distorted. Therefore, even when people try to love each other or people try to be good to each other, it doesn't work. It breaks down. And you've got to look at the more uh, deeper social uh, matrix in order to understand why there is uh, fragility in social life, uh, even when if people intend it to be good, or why it seems to, there seems to be very hollow uh, social life, why people are living with atomistic, alienated individuals, um, or that people are selfish and nasty and brutish and all that that Hobbes said. So, um, so this level of this distinction, uh, I think, is very important, uh, uh, and 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 that's what I was trying to focus at. And of course, this is not uh, a priori in the Kantian sense. Uh, these are part of our background; they're historically constituted. I mentioned that, that this is a historical; it's layered, and it's historically sedimented. So it's not it's not something which is part of our you know mind. Uh, this is not something that is universally a priori in the Kantian sense. This is a this is a historically generated. Uh, but uh, I mean, it's it's as I said, it's so intermeshed and uh, and its, its temporalities are so multiple uh, that there is it's you really need to study it very hard. Uh, to be able to 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 identify, uh, so th this a priori is something which is historical. It's not it's not some. Finally, uh, <laughs> this question. I mean, I I think uh, I've I've written about it uh, uh, about ten fifteen years ago. I think uh, this. Uh, I think uh, we had a much better understanding of our society and our politics in uh, in uh, pre independence India. And that was precisely because the most intelligent people were also good practitioners. I mean, you can see they were multilingual, they were multicultural, bicultural, multicultural, and they were they were they were they were oriented to practices, but they were deeply, deeply intelligent. 
they were also they also were products of some university system, but they didn't they were not locked in that university system. They were moving out out they moved outward and they produced a much better social understanding. You can see that from all our all our great anti-colonial figures. They were absolutely wonderful uh, as as uh, thinkers. I think the university system has made us, uh, frankly, something happened, something wrong, something went wrong, and uh, uh, we shrunk. And uh, uh, you know, the 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 institutional life of the academia uh, created new uh, hiatuses, and uh, and we we we, we th there were distances. That grew between the people and the academics, the academics sort of. And uh, I think uh, one of one other problem has been that uh, the the vertic vertical linkages between people in our universities and people in universities abroad. I mean, we need to be global and cosmopolitan. I mean, we've got to. This is a paradox. I mean, we have to find a solution to that. It's not that we we can't be cut off from the rest of it. After all, the you know university as you acknowledge it. Uh, is is everybody's uh, and we can't just restrict ourselves on the other hand we cannot just have these vertical linkages without horizontal linkages i mean we, we hardly read each other we read only people who are who are uh, sitting abroad and you know even indians who are abroad are better read than people <laughs> you know uh, but then, then we we read each other i mean that's one of the one of the problems that we are facing i mean uh, it's come too late, you know. By now, uh, it's for the younger lot to 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 somehow uh, regenerate a, a better social science. I mean, we 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 have suffered from that social science. Uh, we are I, I, we're not monolingual. We have you know cultures which are the spaces are so shrunk badly. Uh, we, I mean, I, what can I say? I mean. I completely agree with you, and I think uh, in one of the papers that I wrote uh, 10, 15 years ago, which is included in a volume of uh, 15, I, I, I have actually said exactly that. I am trying to get out of that, but it's very hard. It's not easy because our formation as in, in academics has been of a certain kind. I mean, uh, maybe Savitas is not <laughs> because of... Uh, because she is generally bilingual, right? Maybe Manindra is not. Gopal is not. I mean, uh, you know, but people who brought up in Delhi, uh, I think they are. And uh, people who study abroad in, you know, in Delhi, I think they are. And we are only trying to, uh, you know, correct ourselves now. Uh, maybe you don't need to do that. Uh, but I think our social sciences are, are skewed and truncated and have all the flaws. Uh, we, which we need to overcome, and and it can only come when when we genuinely engage. Uh, I mean, I I talk. We we have a general, uh, you know, we need general the generalities, and you know, which is absolutely essential to theory making. And but it has to be empirically mediated. It uh, it has to be shot through with empirical, and the empirical in India is, I mean, this is Indian material, right? We. So I'm now working on Indian religions. Fifteen years ago, when I talked about secularism, it was state versus religion. But what is the idea of religion? I never examined it. Huh? Now, today, I'm, I'm talk when I talked about Indian secularism, my idea of religion was still some Western idea. I didn't have an Indian idea. So for that, you have to study Indian religions and then find out what Indian secularism really is a response to. So I'm trying to, you know, do that, but. Uh, Alas, uh, I mean, I don't think it's too late. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, do you want to go? Wait for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think uh, it was a wonderful session, and I, my, my, I personally enjoyed it. Uh, uh, it opened up several insights into. Can I? Can I have your attention, please? Sorry, I feel insulted if I if you speak in the okay, not humiliated. Uh, no, uh, you know, I also had a last question. That's a big question actually, and I I think uh, I'm 
I am going to disrupt the very notion of what is creativity. Uh, I want to prioritize it, you know. Can creativity be social? That's the big question. And I, my answer at the moment is no. But creativity is essentially individual in terms of literature, in terms of yes, anything. Humanities and philosophy, you will have this creativity as an individual uh, enterprise. And so the challenge before the social sciences is to make it social. One route is to go into what uh, Raju was saying, the deep, deep relationality, and, and he was actually trying to anchor it into different dimensions of uh, our social life. And so I think uh, that is the that's the challenge, I think, though. Don't, don't resolve the questions, Manin, that, that we are out at creativity. No, we are still in search of creativity, which has to, which is actually demanding some kind of a social attention. And so we, when I am speaking, my very speech itself is a speech of individuality, which may be very creative, may be deeply, uh, deeply bad. In our so uh, let's keep this. Keep the, keep the track open and we search for it, you know. And this is not something which is uh, uh, the very the, the derogatively say though is, we are not yet affected by harmoniatic plague. So we'll uh, we'll still discuss and come to at least to plurality, if not that one single hole I was talking about in the ter termite hill. Okay. So I must thank the organizers for giving this wonderful opportunity, Rupa, <laughs> Professor Far. Professor Raju Bhargava, Professor Shah Menon, and all of you who raised these questions and made this uh, gathering deliberation so, so, uh, so uh, uh, both, I think, tantalizing and tragic. Both. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Raju, last one. Thank you. Let me uh, recite four lines from. Uh, Ayodhya Singh Haryod, like when you when you end a session, when you end a day, it it's not it's not only tragic. It doesn't be only feeling tragic, but it also opens the gate for new beauty. Right. So it goes like this. This is about when Krishna is going with Rukmini to see Radha because Rukmini kept telling him that you don't love me, you love Radha. Huh. So he said, if you see Radha, you will also love her. But we have to do it together. So he's taking her in a chariot and they're going to see Radha. So the poet builds a scenario that is going to that is going to lead them to look at beauty in its essence. R Radha was beauty uh, in essence. So he goes like this. Divaska Osan Samiptha, Gagantha Kushlohit Hochala, Taru Shikaparthi Abrajati. Kamalni Pulvalakti Prabha. So, so uh, on behalf of on behalf of all the organizers, I I thank everyone who, as we draw curtains on today's session. I request everyone to rejoin us tomorrow at 9.30 as we convene with our different technical sessions. I would also like to thank all the uh, people who have uh, been together with us in this session online, very patiently listening to everything that was discussed and deliberated upon here. So many thanks to uh, Professor Andrew T. Lamas, Professor Terry Malay, Professor Langsu, and Professor Arnold Farr for holding on for this very long session. But thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.